Hello and welcome to our live stream, our post Melbourne Australian Grand Prix live stream where astonishingly, amazingly, Max Verstappen did not win. Not only did he not win, but he didn't finish. Amazing. There was going to be a brake problem in the race. He's about the last car person combination you would imagine it would afflict. And yet it was. There he was. Start of the race. Brakes binding. Whole thing came off. This is what it looked like in the pit lane where um, I was actually working with Jackie Stewart and a few others in the Rolex suite and, and Red Bull were virtually below us and you can see there what it looked like as sort of mechanics. <laughs> they just look as if they're standing around doing nothing. There was no sense of panic but it's an odd thing actually. It's a really weird thing because when when there's a drama like that and the car's coming in and there's smoke and fire there's still a limited number of people on the pit lane obviously and so they sort of doesn't look as dramatic as perhaps you you think it might but the whole right rear was just totally singed yeah astonishing and so the race went on and and as we know there's Carlos Sainz's winning Ferrari SF24 in the Parc Ferme after the race is that the shape of the big story of 2024 amazing eh? uh wow Car lots to talk about Carlos winning that race and not Charles Leclerc winning that race Sergio Perez not stepping up, not able to step up really from where he qualified, but even so not really stepping up even in the race to do the job that Max couldn't do, the problem that Max had anyway. And then, of course, there's that little incident between George Russell and Fernando Alonso, which I'm sure a lot of you are going to want to talk about. So with no more ado, let's bring those up and have a look at our first question. They won't all be related to things I've just been saying, but nonetheless, um, we'll start at the top with the queue of people. Thank you so much for joining us. Brilliant. Hi, Peter. This is from Gabriel Boulos. Hi, Peter. Why don't drivers follow each other in practice for race simulations? Doesn't it help to get feedback with tires overheating, dirty air, etc.? Continue, please. The next question. OK, I will if I'm, if I'm clever enough to be able to work this. Um, we hear drivers say that feeling on Sunday was different to practice. Wouldn't it be more representative? And thank you for appreciating all the feedback and comment. Yeah, in a couple of situations that would work. I mean, in a perfect world with unlimited running and perfect reliability and the number of laps you wanted to put on the car, totally unlimited, as I say. You could say, let's see how the tyres on, on a three-quarter fuel load react when we are four car lengths behind a car in front we'll get the teammate to do that and then we'll do it in clean air to see how they perform and whether the, how quickly the degradation goes off in the dirty air compared with the clean air you could do all that but believe me race teams are not that organized the odds of actually getting both being able to get both cars out simultaneously at the same time pretty small because there are always different programs on the two cars in the build-up to qualifying anyway in terms of what they're running the problems the driver may be having different problems they're trying to solve and then other things come in you know one car might be later out than another uh, and so it goes on like max in fp2 for example i mean red bull could have i suppose i mean you're looking back now it's a good thought i've just suddenly the light bulb's gone off a little bit you know had max gone out a bit earlier and done a bit more running in fp2 maybe that brake problem might have shown up a bit earlier or before the race anyway uh, and he had and he was late out because he would damaged the floor going over a curb in fp1 on friday morning lunchtime and it took forever to change i had a little I had an interesting discussion with jonathan wheatley after that because i was i wasn't in any way being cynical i was just interested to know why he was so late out because i couldn't imagine it had taken that long to take the floor in other words to change the floor all the time between the two sessions which is well over two hours and then a sort of big bite into fp2 so we're talking two and a half hours basically and bear in mind in the old days as we used to say the we could change a cosworth engine i don't know in under an hour just over an hour i know it's much longer these days but there's a sort of yardstick for you it seems incredible that we've got to 2024 and probably the most, maybe the engine still, I mean, the power unit, the whole thing. But let's put that to one side. But it's almost as long to have to change the floor on the car now. Is it, is it longer than it probably was changing a fuel tank in the old days? And, and that's really a sign of the times, a sign of the importance of aero. And it's also probably you'll find that on the Red Bull Adrian Newey cars, everything's even more precise than all the others. And to get everything absolutely perfect and spot on takes forever. And um, they use these Leica measuring systems, very expensive. I think they're in the million 
dollar million euro range to do everything now forget all the string and all that stuff but they and they're incredibly accurate but they take forever to get it absolutely right. There's no shortcut there. And it is, everything is so precise. And the tiniest, tiniest millimeter of something being out of line can affect the entire airflow of the car. Interesting. Isn't it? Anyway, good question. Thank you very much, Gabrielle, for that. I, haven't, I hope I've answered it to your satisfaction. It's just impractical to do that. And anyway, some teammates wouldn't necessarily want to spend any time driving around at the benefit of the other. In fact, I can't think of any teammates that would want to help one another, really. That's what, that's what Formula One teammates are all about. The guy you want to beat most is the teammate. Um, so thank you very much. This is from Carlos Ergoyen. Hello, Peter. I'm a great fan of you in Formula One. 70 years old now and a fan of the sport since I was 10 or 9. Wow, that is so good to hear. So you are a man, Carlos, of the who's who can remember and remember well, I'm sure, the 60s, the 70s, 80s. Everything that's important. I had a little bit. I got a little bit wound up in the last live stream. One comment about Peter. It's 2024. It's not 1982. Get on with it or something. And it upset me a bit because I think uh, it's nothing to do with you know my style or anything like that. I just feel that history is just as important and just as relevant as today, as indeed the future. Looking after the future is as well. That's just my thing, you know. And I, and it was always. When people say, oh, yeah, I don't really know anything about um, Bert Resmar. I mean, he's just driver of the past. Everything was black and white back then. Um, I just think, um, in photography, that is, I just think, what a shame. Because there's something to learn from everything. And we wouldn't be where we are today, obviously, unless these guys have been out there doing what they did. Anyway, thank you for that. Just a bit of a sidetrack comment um, from you, Carlos. Johannes, the Glen 78 and Mario's qualifying lap. Are there similar bits of Watkins Glen in any of the current circuits? Saw a photo of you and Carlos Reutemann drinking Pepsi after his win. Andretti and Colton Herder. <laughs> should be, yeah, should be in Formula One. Yeah, the Glen, enormous. Uh, wow, this is all over the place already, isn't it? In terms of what people love to talk about with, with Formula One related content. Yeah, the Glen, very fond memories of the Glen. The atmosphere, the time of year which was the fall, um, the atmosphere in that area of Corning and in, in the mountains there, the leaves, the turning leaves, everything was just gorgeous. The circuit with the, I mean, the guardrails were horrendously dangerous, obviously, in the 70s, uh, but they were light blue. And there was something about the guardrails in light blue that made them seem less uh, vicious of course they it was just a, an illusion but that, that was systematic of everything that i felt about the glen i guess everything was done softly and nicely but the circuit bit you back obviously um yeah mario that lap i mean mario many laps in 78 the glen was a, was a circuit on which that car was the lotus 79 was absolutely in tune with the road painted to the road man um and i remember i had a, had a famous dinner with Colin and Mario that uh, on the Saturday night actually and a lot of banter between the two even though we'd lost Ronnie by then and and it was like you know we we're already beginning a new era I guess um, but it was one of the funniest dinners I've ever been to and, and, and Mario it was an Italian restaurant as you can imagine and Mario was just you know it, was, it must have been 50 waiters around him at any given moment. He was, just, and he was up to it as well, as you can imagine. It was really great times. And we shouldn't forget Mario getting the pole for that 68 US Grand Prix at the Glen as well. And I'm saying all this in the context of the way, how badly Formula One has treated Mario Andretti, well, the Andretti family name anyway, in not allowing Michael A to put the team together to come in Formula One wise. And equally, uh, the way that was presented by the FIA. And I keep saying the FIA because the press statement came out from the FIA. No doubt about that. So uh, anyway, going back to the point, he, he, he tried to qualify to race in the Italian Grand Prix in 68. Mario, that is, as, as had Bobby Ansu, who was driving for BRM. And Mario was in the Lotus. And, and, but to do that, he had to, had to run on the first day of practice, which was an, a, f accounted for official grid times, and fly back to Indianapolis to do an oval dirt race, which was a round of the USAC championship that he was trying to win that year, and then fly back and do the Italian Grand Prix on Sunday. And although he'd been given permission to do that and it all been okayed, when it actually came down to it, the, the FIA, I guess, said 
this isn't going to happen. And by the time Mario got back to having qualified, I think about seventh or eighth, his time stood up from Friday, from Thursday, I guess, no, Friday. Um, he went back, um, he got this, he was picked up at the airport by um, this guy in a Fiat 500 who was stuck in the traffic and Mario took over the driving and they got to the circuit in time to to do it, to do the race and was told, got to the circuit and was told oh, there's a problem with you're not going to allow you to do two international events in space of 48 hours so you can't start. So anyway, the first start was the US Grand Prix at Watkins Glen and he took the pole for that. A lot of people at the time said, oh, well, you know, American in the car, obviously he's quick, but local hero knows the circuit. He'd never been to the Glen before in his life. It was the first time he'd ever been to Watkins Glen and he took the pole. And one of the reasons he took the pole is he'd done a lot of testing for Firestone that year and had started to realize with the, with the fast ends they had then, they were still treaded tires, that the longer you ran on this specific compound that they happened to have magically at the Glen, the more grip it had. It became a slick almost. And so he stayed out. Everybody else came in, Graham Hill, Jack Oliver, and all the other hot shots came in, Jackie Stewart for new tires. Uh, Mario just stayed out and the tires got quicker and quicker and he got the pole. Brilliant. So anyway, this is the guy they don't want in Formula One. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, just as a postscript to all that, 82 goes back to Monza, having not raced a Formula One car for, I don't know, about a year, probably. He's No, he, since Long Beach, 82, he drove the Williams FW07C at Long Beach, 82, just the one race for Williams. And then he didn't do any more Formula One, I think, that year. And then um, Peroni had his accident. Obviously, we'd lost Villeneuve as well. And Ferrari drafted him in to do the Italian Grand Prix, the remaining races of the season. And that was like red carpet at uh, Lenati Airport and Mario came down waving to the fans, did a test at Fiorano, went to the track. This is the 126C Turbo. And took the, po took the pole. Primo, pole position, Mario Andretti, Ferrari. <laughs> it was, I'll never forget that. What a postscript to his career. And he won his first Grand Prix in a Ferrari as well. Anyway, all that bit of a sidetrack. Here we go. Eugene, Eugene Mustata. Hi, Peter. A little question about the fine line between racing and engendering other, endangering other, <laughs> engendering, endangering other drivers by breaking Russell's arrow. Didn't, in fact, Alonso just being a racing driver using the track to his advantage? Well, I anticipated a lot of chat about this. My, when it first happened, we only saw one replay and I just thought, what is, what happened then? I just couldn't work it out. And, but then very quickly it became clear that obviously George had become um, confused by something that was going on in front and sort of just turned off the road and went off. And it wasn't, it wasn't that big a shunt because it wasn't sort of eighth gear flat out. So it never crossed my mind that that would come under the heading of, 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 a, of brake testing as it's talked about in, you know, dark corners of the Formula One paddock periodically. Brake testing, just to be absolutely clear, is a phrase that is applied to a driver who does something unbelievably dangerous, flat out on the straight, and just dabs the brakes with his left foot suddenly with a car closely behind him. And the car behind's either got the option of hitting him or going left or right at very high speed. And the only driver I've ever seen do that is Etten Senna at uh, Spa 87, opening lap with Nigel Mansell. Although, I, and I never saw any of the Formula 3 races where I'm sure he did it with Martin Brundle, I think at least twice. And Martin had a big shunt on both occasions. Nigel went off at Spa as well. And, but I've never seen it. But we all know that, that that is a doable thing. And it's just horrendously dangerous. And, and what's happened in, the, in recent times is that the FIA have tried to get on top of that completely as they have everything else that comes under the heading of unsporting behavior by having a massive amount of telemetry that's available in terms of when the driver braked relative to where he braked previously. Was it necessary to brake at all at that point? What was he doing with the throttle? And all that comes under the heading of a, of a specific article for which there is a specific penalty. And, and the odd thing is they've applied all that data and the penalty to Fernando Alonso. But Fernando Alonso didn't do anything in my mind that humanly comes under the heading of brake testing. He was, and I believe him actually, I think he was just sort of faffing around. You know, he got George Russell behind him and I think he'd assumed George was going to pass him. And with sort of four or five laps to go, he thought, well, I've got half a chance of beating George. I might as well, you know, do all I can. And he was doing, being wily Fernando, as we've seen him before. And not, probably not the only driver on the grid that would do this, but just playing a little bit with delaying the car mid-corner, getting on the power a little bit later so George has to back off and then pulling away. That's not brake testing. That's just track craft and quite good driving, actually, providing 
you're not doing it in a way that endangers the driver behind you. Now, the problem today is DRS and how close a driver can be to you because of DRS. And also, an even bigger problem is that the F if you're trying to do this, is that the FIA are now clearly monitoring that sort of situation. And so you've got to be pretty careful if you're Fernando Alonso, in, if you're going to try that, in not thinking, oh, well, I've done this before with Michael and Imola and a few others. I'm just going to be doing the same thing. It's no problem. Because times have changed. Times have changed. You know, it is telemetry and it's a, and it's a penalty. So I think, well, I, th I think a number of things from all of this, which is that what Fernando did was basically okay. I'm surprised that George had the shunt that he did because of what Fernando did because it wasn't really brake testing. It was just coming, it was just doing, it was just going into the corner a bit slower. And it's completely different to being flat out on the straight and braking suddenly in the middle of the straight. And, and somebody braking a little bit earlier and doing what he did and then downshifting and even upshifting again, you know, it's back end of a Grand Prix, things, funny things happen. Brakes go, tires go off suddenly off the cliff. You've got to be a little bit Aware, wary of what that of what was going to happen with the car in front. Just be prepared for a few things. And I'm not in any way criticizing George's and George because he wasn't to blame in any of this. But what I would say was that there was no margin left, obviously, from George's perspective because the minute something wasn't exactly as he expected it to be, he went off. And and I think when it is the back end of the race and it's somebody like Fernando, <clears throat> and obviously he's not that quick. The tires are going off exponentially almost, you do leave a little bit of margin if you can't overtake that and you're behind him, pretty closely behind half a second he was. So that's one thing. And I think also if if what Fernando did triggered this whole, this was a brake test and this is the penalty clause, which it clearly did, then the penalty is a complete and utter joke because he didn't he didn't suffer anything really. What did he suffer? The team actually gained as much as it lost because Lance Stroll suddenly got his position instead of Fernando, which would have pleased the Strolls, probably. Um, he was still in the results. It was just a p time penalty. You know, to me, it, this brake testing is so dangerous. It is about the worst thing. Well, it is the worst thing that any racing driver can do to another. And again, just to repeat the point, I don't think that's what Fernando did. But the penalty that we saw applied is clearly th the current 2024 brake testing penalty. And if that's what it is, I mean, it's just absolutely inexcusable. Anybody that brake tests another driver and he's caught, I, in my view, should be disqualified, excluded from the next two or three Grand Prix, something as serious as that, because it's that bad. And, and this penalty was absolutely nothing. And I think, I mean, final point, all credit to Fernando in a way for, I shouldn't say all and then in a way, okay, I'll go down the pipe. All credit to Fernando for being a bit creative in the way he uses the car and not being predictable because we want drivers to be using their creativity and their imagination without endangering other drivers, quite obviously. And I think that's what he did. I can't imagine that in a million years, Fernando was thinking, oh, maybe th maybe what I'm doing now, George will have a big shunt, which will be great. I just can't imagine he thought that. And I know he didn't. So um, anyone who does think that, I think, gets it completely wrong. Excuse me. Um, so, yeah. That's what I think. There'll probably be some more comments on that, but that's the initial, those are my initial thoughts. He says, um, Carlos Irogen is it back again. Thank you. I'm thinking is I'm thinking about the Andretti case and the reasons the no entry. What are Williams giving for image top very healthy teams when the team didn't even have a spare tub? Yeah, absolutely right. Um, yeah, it's a good point, isn't it? Because the FIA went on about. Um, how the Andretti name would benefit more from coming into Formula One than Formula One would benefit from having the Andretti name. That was the phrase that really got up my nose. But beyond that, there was, you know, will they be ready? Will they be professional enough? Yeah, okay, you know, I think it's a stupid question, but nonetheless, they asked it. And here's Carlos saying, Carlos Irigoyen, I hope I pronounced that correctly, saying, yeah, well, good point. What about Williams not even having a spare chassis at the Australian Grand Prix? How professional was that? Very, very good point, Carlos. And I'm still, I woke up this morning, jet lagged as I am, still absolutely astonished that Williams didn't have a spare chassis. But, I, you know, I don't think, having said all of that, I don't think Alpine did either. And But I know in Alpine's case, they're a little bit, well, they are behind in production because of the dramas they had getting the car through crash testing. And as I keep saying, as I said in the videos, I haven't heard anybody say that Williams had a crash testing drama. So there's no real excuse for not having that chassis there. Absolutely. I mean, 
a sort of semi-professional sports car team would probably have a spare chassis in the back of a truck at a test somewhere. I mean, it's just unbelievable that they had to do that. And isn't it ironic that after all that, I mean, Logan Sargent's been doing a pretty good job, I think. Pretty good job. He probably over-delivered from what I thought he would do. And, I, and I've always been a fan of his ever since his Formula Renault days. And uh, But I, you know, I think he's gone pretty well. It's quite a high-pressure situation in which he has found himself in the last two years. And for him to be actually have a massive lose also on the Friday, but hold it to the point where he didn't hit anything and bring the car back to the pits undamaged, and then be the guy that's been asked to leave his seat and give it to Alex Albon, who has crashed in FP1, when you shouldn't be crashing anyway. I mean, FP1, give me a break. And um, and what did Al Alex do? You know, he didn't didn't look that good. He didn't score the points. They said, oh, well, you know, you've got to get a points finisher here now, get the, get the class driver in there. Again, I'm not in any way decrying Alex because I think he is very good, but I don't know what they were thinking. You know, was he think, were they thinking that he was that much better than Logan Sargent, that he was going to take a car, a P11, P12 car and bring it into the points? Well, quite clearly he couldn't and didn't. So to me, that's really bad. And, it's, and I just think it's a bad thing that they did all round. And again, to make the point, I can't imagine why Logan Sargent was sitting around at the race. He should have been out there making sure the bankers stopped the payment, next payment to the team because it's just not on that. Ah, oh, we're getting a bit feisty now, aren't we? Um, Carlos Irrigan, is this the image that FOM was afraid of? It was referring to not letting Andretti in. Well, yeah, as I keep saying, a lot of people are blaming FOM, F1 and Liberty for this. I, to me, it all is set squarely with the FIA and the teams, two different things. And the teams quite clearly didn't want Andretti in because it was going to make the slice of the cake smaller, their slice of the cake smaller. But the way it was handled was definitely at the FIA end, and that's, um, you know, not good. And, and not good at all. And I think more than anything, it's indicative of the split that's the rapidly expanding split, probably, between the FIA and Liberty and, and how, that's, how the sport's being governed and how the sport is being administered. So read into that what you will. Thanks very much for all that, Carlos. Lou Sequoia. Hi, Peter. What is your best and worst souvenir memory, that is, of Formula One in Montreal? And is this old school track doomed? Well, it's only doomed if the money's not going to come through commensurate with what it needs to pay in order to stay on this rapidly expanding calendar. Uh, so let's hope that that doesn't happen again. Can the Canadian Grand Prix had its ups and downs and money's occasionally been an issue. But I, like you, I love that circuit. I love that part of the world. And uh, as it happens, the Formula One exhibition is opening in Toronto pretty soon. So uh, the whole thing's mega. Um, but yeah, I hope it's not doomed. That's all I can say. Um, let's hope it's not because we need Canada and there's a tremendous racing history in Canada. And guess what? There's a, I think the Ferrari club membership in Canada per head is greater than any other country in the world. It certainly was a, a few years ago. Massive Ferrari supporting Canada, which is pretty good for Formula One, isn't it? Given the way things are going right now. Um, best souvenir of Montreal? Oh, wow. I mean, so many from that race. I guess Gilles winning in 78, the first one in the snow when the race was held in October. That race in general, I mean, Carlos getting the pole uh, beating Jill, which really annoyed Jill on the basis that nobody had been to that track before. Although Jill had done a few laps sort of at home, just, just dry. I don't think it was in a race car even, I mean, fairness to Jill. Anyway, he was blown away by Carlos getting the pole. They were both driving for Ferrari at that point. But it was Jill who won the race and very good win for him. I suppose Jensen Button's win uh, was one of the most, uh, was also one of the best drives I've ever seen, actually, just brilliant win for McLaren. Um, worst memories? Well, certainly the cold, that was for sure. Um, just trying to think. I suppose in many ways the 81 Canadian Grand Prix in the wet when I think, you know, Carlos should have been first or second in that race. He probably should have won it on, he would have won it on Michelin. Jacques Lafitte won it on Michelin's. But, and the Goodyear's were terrible. But you know, that was the race in which Carlos could have not clinched the championship, but he would have made the championship virtually, you know, 
all done and dusted. And there was a drama, not drama, but before on the Saturday night of the race, Carlos asked me to find Frank Williams, and Carlos and I'm the Williams, obviously on the Goodyears, and said, Peter, um, very funny thing I've been thinking of, but I don't believe Frank has a contract with Goodyear. Bernie basically pushed him to go back to Goodyear when um, you know everything was settled between the FIA and and the teams. And but I don't think he's got a contract. And I can tell you tomorrow if we're if it's wet, we'll be nowhere, and Michelin will dominate the race. And don't forget, Carlos had won the Brazilian Grand Prix that year in the wet on uh, on Michelin. So um, he knew what he was talking about. And and I said, yeah. And, and he said, well, go and find Frank. See if we can run Michelin's tomorrow. I thought, Phew. anyway, I really tried my hardest to find Frank. I sort of rushed over Montreal. It was going to be eight, nine o'clock at night. I just couldn't find Frank anywhere. I went back to the track everywhere. Never found him. Anyway, that was the last that happened about that. And you may think, well, you know, it would never have happened. But I was talking to Frank about this um, in about December when he was trying to rehire Carlos for 82. And I said, Frank, you know, one of the things that got up his nose was that thing in Canada, we just couldn't find you. And, you know, I'm interested, to, I'm interested to know what you would have said if I'd, if I'd found you. And Frank looked at me and he thought, well, so the first point is that Carlos is absolutely right. We didn't have a contract with Goodyear. We were just running them. So legally, we could have run the Michelins, no problem at all. And I'm sure they would have given us tires. And yes, I think Carlos would have won that race on the Michelins. Would I have done it? Not sure. <laughs> that was the end of the conversation. Really, I suppose that was, I, looking back now, I think, Argh. anyway, there you go. Um, I, and I was actually standing over the uh, start line when it was, the start was different lo location to now. It was up just coming out of the hairpin when the Riccardo Paletti accident happened and he was sadly killed on the line. And I, I think that was, you know, it has to come under the heading of the worst moment for me. Uh, those, you know, accidents like that, just phew, terrible. Um, GTI Elevator, that's an interesting name. Hi, Peter, and thanks for the great knowledge you're sharing with us. Well, you know, sometimes you get a bit foggy sometimes. I, I, big thanks to everybody that doesn't give me a hard time periodically. Lewis in Ferrari, could that be Aramco Ferrari partnership? I'm sure there must be a greater plan than the prestige that he brings. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I look, it smells like something from a sort of Alcon level, doesn't it? Something at the top. That uh, and the share price has moved, and I suppose all the white-shirted people are very happy. Open neck collar, very happy with the share price and all the rest of it. I mean, as I, as I said in those videos, this thing called the way of things, the natural way of things. So the natural way of things in Formula One is that Charles Leclerc has announced, or well, Ferrari announced, they've re-signed Charles Leclerc over the winter long-term contract. Everybody happy with that. And then the season starts and race three, Carlos Sainz, his teammate, blows him away and wins the Australian Grand Prix in unbelievable fashion. Beautiful drive. And the way, natural way of things is that, oh, yeah, now Carlos Sainz is sitting down to renew his contract with Ferrari, multi-year contract. What a team. Wow. But of course, that's not happening. They've already signed Lewis. And Carlos Sainz is, although he's just won this Australian Grand Prix, in the way he's won it, the devastating way in which he's won it, is still waking up on Monday mornings thinking, what am I going to be doing next year? And it's, a, it's not right. You know, that, that to me is completely out of sync with the nature of humanity and the nature of Formula One and the way of the world. It's just not right. Because there is nowhere he's going to go that's going to be as good as where he is. And where he is right now, he's doing a really good job. There's no reason for him to be leaving that team. He's a perfect complement. I wouldn't even use the word teammate to Charles Leclerc. And, and it's all going to go for no reason, really. And, and Ferrari signing Lewis at the back end of Lewis's career because it's incredibly good for business, really good for the image, really good for the share price. And anyway, there's no downside because Lewis is still mega quick and he's going to, if the car's a winning car, for sure Lewis is going to win races and he might even win the world championship. So where's the downside? I suppose you, they wouldn't have been able to tick every one of those boxes with Carlos Sainz. But this is where, this is where motor racing and, and what is right about Formula One gets completely swamped and taken over by other things and I'm you know as you as I'm a massive Lewis Hamilton fan purely because of the way he drives and the way he is as a racing driver and I think it's the way he handles himself as well as a human being out of the car and I, you can't blame Lewis at all because of the offers there I would take it he would he, he's definitely taken it, obviously and, and anybody else would take it but 
why did Ferrari do that? That's the bizarre thing. And you know, they got this great combination of drivers and they're splitting it up. So um, I don't know what to say about it beyond that, really, other than I really hope Carlos Sainz gets a reasonable deal wherever he's going to go. As I said, you know, he can go to, he can do a plug-in job at Mercedes, but I think he'll probably know it's a plug-in job because they're, you know, they're so into, into uh, Kimi Antonelli. And it's probably only for one year and it'll be an uncomfortable one year, maybe in a good car, maybe not with George Russell in the other car, trying to get to know the team and then suddenly switching, I guess, to Audi if he's going to do that. Or it's going to Audi straight away on a mega contract and he's saying to them look it's pretty clear in 2025 I'm going to be at midfield at best I'm a Grand Prix winner if you want me to go through that growing year with you guys to be there for the next 10 I'm going to have to be paid massively to drive around in the midfield instead of winning Grand Prix as I should be and then he may be doing that sort of deal and getting massive money to compensate for not being mega quick in 25 in a, in a Sauber I doubt it though. I doubt Sauber would do that. And don't forget it's Audi really calling the tune now. So I doubt they would either. You know, they would think it's an honor for anyone to be driving for them probably. So it's a difficult one. Then, you know, Red Bull maybe, as I said, you know, I've heard that Alex Albon still got some sort of deal that he could do. Sergio Perez supposedly has done a deal. You hear all these things from people that know. And Carlos Sainz doesn't seem to be getting a mention there. And it's such a shame because he's now driving absolutely the peak of his ability. So there we go. Paulid 111. How did you rate Mike Thackle? He had one of the shortest Formula One careers. Yeah, he uh, quite a difficult guy to hang around and talk to and get to know. He's always one of these sort of sparky chip on the shoulder personalities. Pretty quick, very quick. I... Um, can't remember how this happened but I think it was I think I knew him well enough at one point um, who was it somebody said to me if Mike Thackwell races in the Canadian Grand Prix and I'm having to sort of scratch here what year it was he would then be the youngest driver ever to start a Formula One race and so I rang that's right I, who told me that somebody told me. anyway for some bizarre reason I ended up playing tennis with Mike in near my house in Beaconsfield in England. And I remember he had a one of the new big Prince rackets. And I thought, wow, that's one of the new big Prince rackets. And he was pretty good, obviously. And we played tennis. And, I remember, and at the point, I was able to ring Ken Tyrrell and say, Ken, you should be running Mike Thackwell because if you do, he's going to set this record. And Ken incredibly said, oh, that's a great idea, Peter. I think we will. Put me in touch. And they did. They did the deal. That's how easy it was. So that was my role in all that. I had some sort of falling out with him. I can't remember where. I think it was at the Jackie Stewart mechanics thing at Glen Eagles one year after that, obviously. And he and I said something and he sort of snapped back about some, I don't know, probably something I'd written, I don't know. And, and we never really spoke after that. His dad, Ray, was a, a gold miner, I think, wasn't he? And in, in Western Australia. And his sister is married to David Brabham think so yeah I don't know not not what I call one of my closest friends as you can imagine but pretty quick and he had that massive shunt at Thruxton I think didn't he yeah, around the back um Augusto hi Peter could you do a breakdown on Vettel teamwork raw driving decision making and how he continued how he contributed to the Red Bull machine <laughs> that's a big ask what would you say to those who detract from that success thanks um I think raw talent, as much raw talent as anybody out there, incredible car control, uh, as we saw in his Sauber BMW Friday days when he was getting used to new tracks and, and, he, and he was always super confident and really on the power early and braking late. And those were the days when Fridays were really good for young drivers because, you know, they were out there. Nobody was saying this is your one and only chance. And, and they were out there actually doing a job with the team, getting the car Doing, that, doing decent testing for the team and getting good information and they were going quickly and and he looked really good from the moment he got in the car and then he did that uh, he stood in for Robert didn't he at the US Grand Prix scored points in his first race and then Red Bull hired him and yeah I mean that win in Monza was just outstanding 
outstanding win. He dominated it, uh, really, from qualifying right through to the race in those conditions in the, what was it called, the Toro Rosso then? I guess so. And But don't forget his teammate um, finished fifth, didn't he? Poof. It was the French racing driver. I'll remember his name in a second. So it wasn't as if that was a bad car. It was obviously a very good car. Not that, um, you know, detracted from either driver, but all I'm saying is the car was really good. Everything worked well, and he did a great job. And as a result of that, he got the job at, at Red Bull A-Team. And it, it, in my mind, it then kind of coincided. It was a perfect storm, if you like, double whammy, where Seb's natural style of driving, which is very, very early into the corner, to the point where it was so early that he, he could only really do what Jean Alesi used to do, which is just sort of, and, and Jacques Lafitte, really, when he had good grip, just sort of do a very slow rotation and a, a classic V. Uh, not all corners it could be applied to, but the classic V was Sebastian Vettel's signature. And, and, and at that point, Red Bull came up with a back end that enabled him to do that better than anybody else of that ilk, that style in the history of the sport really and what you need there it, what you need at your rotation significantly is not a great front end it's a great rear end that's what you need and that's what Red Bull were giving him for three or four years and he was just unbelievable so quick but then the minute that that regulation changed they started to take downforce away from the rear of the car he began to struggle and that's why you saw him struggling in his last year at Red Bull and I think that showed up a flaw in his driving, which he was unable to manipulate the car the way a Max now can manipulate the car. If he doesn't have a great back end, he creates nonetheless a rotation that is still perfect. And he, and he trades off braking against steering load in a way that Seb never really did. Seb was just bong down to a rotation point that he was really good at defining. But there was no real trade-off braking against steering it was just breaking down to that point and incredible feel and car control of things were slightly wrong and and that's where that fault showed up and and th and i think this is the major problem sebastian then had for the rest of his career he didn't then dig deep and say why am i getting beaten here by daniel ricardo there's something i'm not doing that he is uh, and instead of which he sort of right i'm out of here i'm going to go to ferrari where i'll be a four times world champion and they really want me and the car will be brilliant and i'll win another world championship or two and of course it never happened because he always had that flaw in his driving and it was and it showed up again at ferrari and that's why i think he struggled in the back end of his his career because he never really got on top of that one specific issue and i think he had the talent he had this incredible god-given uh, has this incredible god-given natural flair and car control and ability to be able to do that it's just that at red bull i don't think they ever showed it to him and ever really talked about it and anyway when you win four world championships you start believing that you've got nothing to learn and really it's you know it's got to be the car or the team if you're not winning races so and that happened at ferrari and that's why it was a relatively uncomfortable time for him ferrari i think and then Aston Martin, the same thing. That's why I think Lance Stroll on occasion looked pretty good alongside Sebastian, looked much better than he looks alongside Fernando. Uh, input, yeah, young, young, you know, high tech guy, young German, very studious, uses his brain, intelligent, articulate. Yeah, of course. I mean, he dovetailed beautifully with everything Adrian was doing with the car. Uh, you know, feedback, it's these days, the telemetry is so good. All you really want, if you're an Adrian, is a guy that's absolutely on the limit and driving that car as quickly as it can physically go over one lap. That's the way you measure improvement. And that's what Sebastian gave them. But Mark Webber, you know, he had his days, didn't he? He was, sometimes he was quicker than Sebastian, sometimes he outraced Sebastian. And, you know, that was interesting. And then, as I say, Daniel Ricciardo blew him away in that last year. So it was... Um, Am I detracting from his success? I'm not. I'm saying that his style of driving and what the regulations allowed Adrian Newey to do produced the perfect storm for about four years, those four world championships. Combine that with his natural talent anyway and his methodology, then you've got the Sebastian that we saw in Formula One. Really good bloke. I mean, the, the only other thing I'd say, I thought that incident when he drove into, the, into Lewis's car, Baku, behind the safety car because he felt Lewis, you know, obviously there was aggro between him and Lewis anyway. And then he felt Lewis is going deliberately slowly, even though Lewis is doing nothing wrong at all. And he just gets his red mist and drives into Lewis behind the safety when they're both behind the safety car. That was inexcusable. He got away with that, you know, but as a world champion for doing that, for setting that sort of example to young drivers, I thought it was appalling. And the FIA should not have allowed him to get away with it so leniently, in my opinion. And I always had that 
slight reservation about him after that. You know, for me, he was always the guy that did that, as was Daniel Tickton, did a similar thing. And, but he lost his license for a year, interestingly, when he did it, and, and, and Seb didn't. Um, Cosmos Trek. Hello, Peter. Do you know Michael Andretti? Did you know he would become a global race car team owner? I don't know him very well. I knew him reasonably well uh, when he was, when Mario was winning races and Michael was doing, I think he was saying Super V and stuff at that time. I met him once or twice then through Mario uh, when I was in the States and then got to know him a bit when he was, uh, oh, got to know him obviously in... 1993 when he came over and raced the McLaren Ford I thought he did better than I thought he would actually I think he did I think he did a pretty good job very difficult time at that for McLaren that year with that engine and that the whole way the team was and beyond that at the center as your teammate was never going to be easy but he didn't make life easy for himself with the family that he brought with him and the aggro that caused with Ron Dennis and everything was difficult that year and so yeah that's about I knew him a little bit the odd time I went over to the States to watch IndyCar racing. You know, I, I remember um, asking Mario once, I guess it was about 78, who, who was the quicker of his two sons, Jeff or Michael? And he said, uh, I said, well, Michael's the guy that's going to make it. Uh, he's, got the, uh, he's got the burning ambition, but Jeff's the guy with the talent. I remember him saying that. Of course, Jeff never really did make it, but he was quick when he was out there. And Mario was pretty much spot on there. The burning ambition. It's a good little combination of words, isn't it? You've got to have burning ambition to make it. And Michael had that. Global race car team owner. Wow, yeah. I mean, he always, he always had good people around him and the ability to get good people around him was um, shining out pretty vibrantly for most of his career. So I'm not really surprised. And he's done a really good job, hasn't he? Great. Um, Cosmos Trek. Hello, Peter. That is Cosmos again. Do you know Bernie Eccleston? How many people do I know? Do you know Bernie? Did you know he would become a billionaire and turn Formula One into a billion dollar business? Well, yeah, I knew he was a billionaire in 1972. Well, not quite that much billion. I don't suppose billionaires were talked about as much then, but um, I got to know Bernie in, yeah, 72. Mr. Aramis, <laughs> bottle of Aramis aftershave every morning drenched himself um you know big pointed collar shirts and always very smartly dressed if that's the right adjective and i got to know him pretty quickly although i wasn't a backgammon player and usually a backgammon player got their nose in the door fairly fast with with bernie but uh, yeah i mean through david I, I worked for david phipps when i first came over to england from australia very good photojournalist who happened to be a very close friend of Bernie's as well. So quite early on, I was writing press releases and media statements, if you like, for the Brabham racing organization that Bernie had just bought at the, over the winter of 71. And that was not only Formula One, but also F2 and F3 and descriptions of the cars. And, um, and, he, and even then, I was completely bedazzled by this guy and how, uh, how difficult he was. Uh, and, and I got to know Keith Green pretty well, who was the team manager of Brabham at that point. Really good guy, former Formula One driver, uh, really switched on racer. Bernie liked him, but he told me, but he left the team after about six months because I said, Keith, I said, why have you left? I can't believe you left Brabham. And he said, well, Peter, I just, you know, I got fed up with it in the end because, you know, I'd be, I'd be on to Bernie all day wanting to talk to him about some issue with the team. And eventually he'd turn up in his Merc and he'd turn up down at the uh, place near Brooklands and, uh, you know, and he'd, and he'd go around and he'd go around like a whirlwind as he normally would and he'd talk to all the boys and it was it. And then he'd get back in the car and say, Bernie, we haven't even had a meeting yet. And he said, well, you come over here and he waved to me and he's back in his Mercedes and he's starting to drive down the driveway at 10 miles an hour and accelerates to 15. I'm sort of running next to the car trying to give him a briefing on what we're talking about with the next race and what we're going to do with some sponsor or how we're going to get this new engine in. And uh, in the end, I just say, Bernie, bye-bye. You won't see me tomorrow, mate. I'm off. <laughs> so that was that. And that's how Bernie was, you know, he was, he was very tough. And, um, can I drop a, a little bit of a name? I was talking to Ron Howard the other day. And uh, Ron was saying that when he was trying to make um, Rush, at one point he asked Bernie if um, he could use any of Bernie's older cars from his collection. 
and Bernie said, no, 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 you know, don't really want to get, you know, they, they, they run periodically, but you don't want them out on racetracks doing stuff like that. And Ron said, yeah, but Bernie, um, you know, there must be somebody, you know, who, I can, who, who sort of looks after them and, uh, and is in charge of them and, and can get them fired up. And we'd look up, we'd get them all insured for sure, you know, we'd do our thing. And Bernie said, yeah, there is somebody who looks after him. He's called Eccleston. And the answer's no. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and Ron was laughing at this point, as you would. But that's classic Bernie. He, he rang me up relatively recently, actually, to complain about something. I can't remember what it was. And, but yeah, I talked to him and he's um, hasn't changed at all since, 19, since the Bernie I knew in 1972. Exactly the same guy. Still as sharp as a knife, I would say. And still plotting and still having a laugh behind closed doors at various things going on. The interesting, most interesting one at the moment, of course, is Felipe Massa's civil lawsuit against the FIA over the result of the 2008 Singapore Grand Prix on the basis that I think his evidence his evidence has to be that Bernie or he'd found out through Bernie via Bernie I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth because this is a legal thing that Bernie had led or Bernie one of Bernie's minions had led Felipe to believe that that race was going to be rigged even before it started and that's going to be Felipe's point I think and um but it's fairly, I mean, I'm Bernie, big, very close to Felipe's family and Felipe himself for the, certainly the back half of Felipe's career. And probably did quite a lot to help Felipe, actually, I think. And, and he's already said, well, I don't remember saying that, which is what he would say, wouldn't he? And uh, equally, sadly, Charlie is no longer able to talk about it. And um, I don't think, I mean, the general feel in, in Melbourne was that well, everyone's saying, oh, no, you won't get anywhere with that lawsuit. But apparently Liberty or the FAA, or I guess it's Liberty, have had to put aside 83 million or something just in case as a sort of, you know, um, something might happen. I, as I said before, I think Felipe just wants someone to say we're sorry. And I, a lot of people think, oh, he wants money. I don't think he wants money. I think he's got enough. And I think he's I think he just wants the record put straight. Difficult for a guy, of course, that had a problem in that race with the fuel filler and so people will say you know dragging that thing down the pit lane people say well you know it's all irrelevant because he was the race meant nothing to him but what he's saying is that the race should be completely deleted from the world championship there is no precedent for that although this deletion business is the precedent of course is michael being deleted if that's the right word from the uh was it the 97 world championship where after the thing in uh, Hereth with jack villeneuve although he kept the race wins and the points he was he was excluded from the world championship, whatever that means. It's a bit like Heinz Puller saying to me when I asked him if he'd taken my keys by mistake. Hundred percent no, but I'll check anyway. <laughs> How can you keep your points and your race wins but be excluded from the championship? Just doesn't. It's a classic thing, wasn't it? Excluding from the championship meant nothing because he'd only finished second anyway. Anyway. Um, Hello, this is Cosmos Trek. Hello, Peter. James Vells confirmed Williams was still using Excel to keep track of parts. He also said they were using the original version of Excel purchased by P. Windsor in 89. Well, there you go. But when I, when I um, authorise that, and I, here, I should, um, here I should point out that I was with Williams in, from 85 to 88, and then I rejoined Williams in 91. So when he says purchased by P. Windsor in 89, possibly back end of 88. I authorised that. I do recall vaguely that whole thing, but I, I remember thinking at the time, no, there's no way I want this still in use in 2024. <laughs> I'm only joking, of course, but what's all that about? He's saying the Excel, the Excel spreadsheet told them that the spare chassis was in Melbourne. When they got there, it wasn't. Is that what we're saying? Um, Hamza Chowdhury. Do you think Hamilton has passed his peak? He also said that you don't think Alonso is a great qualifier, but he seems to have kept his pace better than Lewis, as he's been the better qualifier since 22. Yeah, but you can't compare two different teams. When you're looking at a qualifier, you're only looking at the driver versus his teammate and what you think is the overall capacity of that car, potential of that car, and has that potential been reached? And I just, I just, I'd say you can't compare another driver in another team when you're evaluating qualifying, in my opinion. Uh, but what I do think is that Alonso makes more mistakes in qualifying laps than, say, a Lewis or a Max or a 
Carlos Sainz. Uh, yeah, or, or a Charles as well, probably. He, he, you know, he does have moments, as we saw in Melbourne, under pressure. You know, he, he, he ran over a curb or something, didn't he, in Q3, right at the end. And so that's what I mean. I don't think he's a great qual I don't think he's, he is as great a qualifier as he is a racing driver. That, that's what I really mean. He's obviously, by most standards, he's an outstanding qualifier. But he's not actually as good at qualifying as he is at racing. That is what I mean. Um, is Hamilton past his peak? Yeah, probably. He's not getting any younger. He's already won seven world championships. He's gone through the agony of everything that happened in Abu Dhabi 21. And at Mercedes after that, rubbing it all in, if you like, with the teammate he didn't really want and a car that's obviously patently not a race winner. And so, apart from once or twice. And so, yeah, I mean, given all that road dust, how could you expect him to be absolutely, absolutely at his peak? What I do think is that in a new team like Ferrari with breathing f new air, if the car feels really nice underneath him in terms of balance and grip, and he's relaxed in his mind, I think he would still be as quick over one lap as he ever was. What I also think is that if, and we're seeing it at the moment, if the car doesn't feel great underneath him, he isn't gonna push it to the same limit that George Russell will take it to. And I think that's quite understandable at where he's at in his career. So in that sense, you could possibly say that's why I say he's probably not at his peak, because if you're at your peak, really, you're getting ex extracting the maximum from a car in every possible situation. And you're still as hungry as a dog in every situation. But how can Lewis, how can any of us expect Lewis to be as hungry as a dog or as hungry as he was in 2007? with seven world championships behind him and how can we expect him to be constantly on a very edgy high speed flick oversteer limit for lap after lap after lap when he's racing for seventh place i don't expect him to do that and i totally think it's totally understandable that he isn't doing that hamza charity says why did alonso get a penalty george didn't have to take avoiding action so it can't be a brake test he crashed because of dirty air which the driver ahead can't be responsible for did he crash because of dirty air? I don't think he did. I think he crashed because he was a bit confused and lost concentration and, and sort of went offline a bit. I don't think it was just dirty air. And, and, and therefore, you can say he went off because of something that Alonso was doing that was not something that he could predict or had anticipated. But in my view, Alonso shouldn't have got a penalty. I think he was playing around, faffing around, as you are entitled to do if you're leading somebody else. And he was looking at ways of slowing the car mid-corner in a normal racing driver way, not in a brake testing way, and then getting a run on acceleration, which you know most, most racing drivers do and have done at any point in their career, some point in their career. But, but again, I want to make the point that if... I want to make the point that given the amount of telemetry information that was then distributed to the media, it's pretty clear that that in their mind that came under the heading of a brake test because all the measurement uh, parameters were where did you brake relative to the previous lap? Did you uh, inadvertently um, come get onto the power later, whatever it was? All those measuring sticks are used to verify whether or not somebody is brake testing. And then they applied their brake test penalty, which to my mind was pathetic. And so did Alonso get a penalty? Not really. I mean, what was the penalty? Just moving Lance Stroll up in the results and his teammate and what, three points. Do they add up to anything? I don't think so. Cosmos Trek. Good news, Lola entering Formula E with Yamaha. Yeah, yeah, I was reading about that today. That's Mark Preston, of course, who's mega guy, good friend who used to be a McLaren engineer, F1. Um, then Super Aguri, he was Mr. Super Aguri with Otmar Saf now and Taku Sato and, well, all the rest of them, really. Uh, you could actually say with um, Akayo, is it Ayo? Ayayo um, Kamatsu as well, currently team principal at Haas, doing a very good job. Yeah, that was a great little team at Super Aguri. And that was all, uh, Mark Preston was there as well. And Mark Preston now having won several Formula E championships and then stopped that, went to incredibly and very nicely, went to be CEO, whatever, chairman of Lola. Great history, wonderful company. Uh, probably because he just loves the idea of Lola, uh, as we all do, and all the great cars they build over the years. That was Dexter, by the way, not quite sure. Oh, no, it wasn't Dexter. We got another dog staying over at the moment. That was, that was Geronimo. 
<laughs> Great name for a golden retriever, isn't it? The Dexter Geronimo interface is quite interesting. Um, but in Spain, it's actually pronounced Geronimo, and they call him Hero, which is quite cool, isn't it? Anyway, um, so yeah, and Mark Preston then, having got to Lola, is now saying, oh, now do Formula E. Mega. So now they're doing Formula E, and they've got Yamaha. Probably Herbie Blash is involved in all that as well, is he? Imagine that. Mark, Mark Preston and Herbie Blash doing a Formula E. I think I've become a Formula E fan, if that's the case. Mega. Um, Sujith. Hey, Peter, isn't it time to appreciate Ferrari? They had a wonderful winter. They built a car with a solid baseline. They understood and can work with. Fred Vasseur is looking like a great leader. Well, yeah, you can't change the words. You can't, we can't say, isn't it time to appreciate Mercedes? They had a wonderful winter. They built a great car with a solid baseline. Toto Wolff is looking like a great leader. I'm just sort of transposing a few words there to see if it works. No, that sentence doesn't work at all. Sorry, that paragraph doesn't work. I agree with you 100%. I've been banging on um, ever since Bahrain about how well Ferrari have embraced their problems of 2023, which were not top speed and were not braking, were basically not having a big enough sweet spot from circuit to circuit on which to sort of set the car up and give the car, give the two drivers an ability to manage the tyres and all the other things. It was very knife edgy like Mercedes. So they basically, because the car is now slower in a straight line through the air, they've obviously got more downforce, inherent downforce in the car. That was just a given. And they've, and it's worked. It's got the balance absolutely right. It's still quick enough to do the job, kind of, most circuits. And not as quick as a Red Bull in a straight line, but quick. And, but they've got the sweet spot. Brilliant. Now, why didn't Mercedes do that? Because you could say the same shortcomings were true about Mercedes, and yet they didn't. They haven't done anything like that at all. They haven't got anywhere near that. So, yeah. And I knew Fred Vasseur would do a good job because of the great job he always did at ASM and ART and, and had been doing at Sauber. And he's a good man, doesn't talk too much, gets on with it. Got very annoyed with Toto Wolf when Toto was banging on about how wonderful Vegas was and, and Freddie was saying, well, yeah, you know, when the, when the storm grates don't come up and destroy the bottom of your chassis. Ferrari had a spare chassis, interestingly, in Vegas last year, didn't they? Um, so he is looking good. And the minute he decided to put Jock Clear on a long-term contract and really get the best from Jock, that's when you knew Fred Vasseur was doing the job. And congratulations to Jock, actually. Ferrari Academy. What... Um, Dino Boganovic won the, what was it? The, yeah, he won the, won the feature race, Formula 3 feature race. Another Ferrari Academy Jock Clear driver, like Ollie Berman. Just while I'm on that, Isaac Hadja. We had a question about Isaac in the last live stream. And he looked pretty good, didn't he? He won the feature race. But I have to say, that move he made at the start of the sprint race was a worrying move because it was, it was a classic young driver new driver thing wasn't it he, he was where was he was p3 i think on the grid and he made a good start and oblivious to the what may be to his right and they're obviously going to be cars because we're talking about the grid now we're talking about moving off the grid he just moves right straight into his teammate and that was just like you know this track belongs to me there can't be anybody there and and, and then saying afterwards to the stewards which i guess he did oh well i couldn't see my mirrors well that's not an excuse is it it's pretty obvious there's going to be somebody there and took his teammate out, who was actually quite good, Marty, Spanish driver, and his teammate, Campos teammate. So he celebrated the win, he won the, win, won the race, and then checkered flag, and then was then given a 10 second penalty, absolutely correctly on this occasion. I was just thinking, wow, long time since the stewards came up with a really good decision, but I'm not that surprised because Tim Mayer was on that panel, and he's a good man, knows what he's doing. Uh, he's the, uh, his uncle was Tim Mayer, the, I can say Formula One driver because he started the US Grand Prix in 63. Uh, very quick driver, sadly killed at the beginning of the 64 season in the Tasman series, driving Bruce's second, Bruce McLaren Cooper, killed at Longford. And it's uh, Tim Mayer's his nephew. And he was one of the stewards at the um, Grand Prix. But I want to say a big congratulations to the Campos team because they then won made up for that by winning this the feature race F2 uh, with Isaac Hadja. And that's not Isaac, that is Adrian Campos Sr., who sadly, very sadly, is not with us. We lost him two or three years ago. But it's his son now doing a brilliant job of taking over that team. And imagine how happy he would be with what we saw in, in Melbourne. Really, really good. And uh, big fan of Adrian Campos, A, as a driver, and B as a, B, as a person, and C, the team he then set up, and the number of young drivers that he's 
helped along over the years. He's an unsung hero, I think, of the feeder formula, Adrian Campos. And for him to win that feature race, I'm just looking at that to make sure I, I, I wrote that down. And Roman Stanek, of course, won the sprint race when Dina, when um, Isaac got that penalty. But yeah, all, all in all, a very good um, F2, F3. Good to have them both out there in, in Melbourne. Incredible that they were all out there, wasn't it? They flew everything with the out. Uh, and as for the inter-battle, inter inter-team battle at Prima in F2, it didn't go anywhere this weekend because Ollie Berman had an engine, had a piston go. He said the engine felt very tight after the uh, untimed session and it was really bad in qualifying and he qualified 16th and they discovered a blown piston and so he started at the back and then had the usual dramas he drove very well in the in the sprint race but then got a penalty for something in traffic and blah 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 so that was that weekend gone but um but Antonelli had no real issues and was quite quick and at one point actually led the feature race but he eventually finished fourth I suppose you could say as a rookie he did very well but as the next um, Michael Schumacher. Mm, I think Michael might have done a better job. I don't know. We'll, we'll reserve judgment, I suppose. We have to. This, I was watching them actually in the garage quite closely. And there is an aura about Kimi Antonelli. There's definitely an aura. And I was trying to think what it made me, what it reminded me of. And it's, uh, you know, you take this as you will, but there was a little bit of that in Senna about, about his body language and the way he is and the way he looks and just everything about him. But there's also a little bit of Stefano Modena. And for those that remember and knew Stefano Modena, you'll think, whoa, because uh, he was definitely odd. I'm not saying Kimi is at all, but there's a bit of Stefano Modena mixed with that in Senna. Whereas... Oli Berman, for me, is pure, unadulterated George Russell. He's just sort of quite edgy and quite, you know, on top of it. And just drives like George, too. Pretty, pretty spiky, but unbelievably quick and car controlly and very good. It's an interesting combination. Haven't really made my mind up about how Kimi drives yet, but he does look to be pretty rounded and pretty early, short cornery sort of guy. I wouldn't want to say that emphatically yet because I'm not 100% sure, but he looks good. But what an amazing contrast to that. Imagine running those two guys. <laughs> oh yeah, Prima, good luck, Rene. Um, Sujith says, when I think of Williams, I see the 2000s BMW Williams in my mind with Frank Patrick and Sam Michael. I'm wondering where... Handsome Sam Michael. Um, I'm, I'm wondering where Sam is now. What's he doing? I think Sam is in Australia, Sydney. I'm not 100% sure, but I think he's doing... I think he's doing something away from racing. Something to do with designing, engineering, some traffic flow thing. I may be wrong maybe old news as well i think he's doing something out there michael massey's out there as well i think he does the odd bit of karting stewardship and does some stuff um so yeah that was they he, it, sam did that sort of what was it called the um the bulldog nose or the sea lion nose or something it was rather an ugly looking car for a while but yeah there were some relatively good years with sam but i'm you know it was kind of Kind of a strange time for Williams that. That was when BMW ultimately wanted to buy Williams. And retrospectively, or even at the time, I thought, wow, I just hope Frank sells before it's too late, really. I remember thinking that. And, and he didn't. You know, I'll hang on. I'm not going to sell my team, keep the shares. And of course, eventually he did have to sell. And it's never really worked out well enough. I think if BMW bought Williams, it would have been a very different... Uh, it might well still be in racing. You know, who knows? Suja says, Liberty Media is going to announce acquiring MotoGP. Okay, good. Good for MotoGP, probably, I would think. Uh, somebody there's going to make a bit of money, I would imagine. Um, okay, my Tin Plate Railway. Now, there's an interesting name. I wonder if he's a model railway enthusiast like Jack Windsor and Sam Posey and Ricardo Patrese. I don't know, maybe. If, big if, Max were to go to Mercedes, surely Red Bull would demand George in return, and George and Carlos at Red Bull would be a pretty formidable lineup. Yeah, but to me, all this stuff about Max is completely and utterly related to Adrian Newey. He's, he's not stupid, Max Verstappen, and he will only move anywhere if, if Adrian is either not racing anymore or Adrian's moved. 
and if Adrian moves, it would be a completely different team anyway. So that new team would be completely different. And Red Bull would very quickly become a very different team. So the key to this is Adrian, always. And is Adrian going to go to Mercedes? Only if Adrian, as I said in the last live stream, I think, if Adrian is so disgusted and so appalled by all the social media fracker to do with everything that's been going on with Christian and Joss, and he's so disgusted by it all, he's going to go and leave and join Mercedes, then Max will go with him for sure. Uh, but I don't think Adrian would thinking would be thinking that way. I think Adrian would be thinking, yes, please, next thing, need to get on with my life. Stop worrying me with ridiculously unimportant detail. That's probably what he's doing. And uh, yeah, signs are it's all going to carry on as normal, isn't it? Isn't that what we all imagine would happen anyway? But anyway, there's no way, in my opinion, there's no way Max would go to Mercedes unless Adrian Newey was going to Mercedes. And speaking of Mercedes and that whole thing, a lot was made over the winter about the return, return of James Allison. And at the moment, it doesn't look great, does it? I'm not, this isn't an exact reflection of, of James, but where they're at right now is absolutely, it, you know, it's not so much that they had whatever that was on Lewis's car. Did he inadvertently or deliberately turn the thing off? No, that's a joke, obviously. Um, but he, he wouldn't have been that unhappy when the whole thing ground to a halt, I wouldn't have thought. But anyway, unreliable. And then this is the overriding point about the George Fernando shunt, isn't it? That it's not so much that did Fernando do something? Was he in dirty air? Should he have anticipated it? Was the penalty too much, too little, whatever? The real point is, what was George Russell doing unable to pass an Aston Martin around the Australian Grand Prix anyway? That's the real point. Mercedes should have been up there beating McLaren. And if you're going to be racing Fernando Alonso's for whatever it was, sixth, seventh place, things are going to happen. And that Mercedes should never have been down there. I mean, it's George Russell, for Pete's sake, one of them. The, as quick as anybody in Formula One when he's out there, maybe not Max, but probably uh, almost just a shade away from Max on one lap. I mean, super quick racing driver. And what was he doing down there? And that's why, you know, what are Mercedes thinking? They're getting beaten. Well, they didn't get beaten by their Williams customer team. I suppose you can say that. Oh, positive weekend. We're very pleased we didn't get beaten by Williams. Yeah, it was difficult otherwise. <laughs> Lee Kambanga. Hi, Peter. I'm, I just have a simple question. Was the Australian Grand Prix more exciting or more competitive? Max out. Carlos won. I was happy for him. People in other media outlets are saying Max is making racing so boring. I was wondering if this was one more exciting. If this was more exciting without him. It seems like a. it was straightforward. Um, hang on. I can't try and read this. It's covered it up. Seems, I also think Red Bull should sign Carlos for 25. Um, well, of course, it was much more interesting the minute Max went out. But that's not because, I mean, if people think racing is boring because Max is winning, then they have either been poorly, um, they've been either poorly advised as to what's going on because racing's never boring. Formula One's never boring, even if the same guy's winning because there's so much going on that is part of that win and part of the losses for everybody else. Depends how you portray it. But if the race commentator on TV is saying, oh, this is really boring, you know, those who are ready to go to the football after this, you know, get ready to press button B, whatever. Of course, the fans are going to start thinking this is boring. But if, if, it's, if it's presented correctly, in my opinion, it's not boring. Um, but of course, it made it much more interesting. We've had many races recently where you could have said, well, if Max wasn't in that race or had retired on lap one, this would have been a phenomenal Grand Prix. And that's what we saw in Melbourne. It's not the first time we've had this amazing battle for second place. Um, and well, it was an amazing battle, but it, Ferrari 1-2 is a big thing, isn't it? And that's what we had. And it, if Max had kept going, probably would have won that race. Although I do think, as I said in the bid on Sunday night, I think it would have been close. I don't think Carlos would have gone away. It would have been an interesting race if Max had continued. I think he probably would have had it, but Red Bull might have done it on strategy. But what we, what we would have had then was exactly the race that Ferrari were talking about over the winter, which was, we think we're going to be 50% nearer to Red Bull than we were in 2023. And if we are there, we're going to be able to put pressure on Red Bull in a way that we've never been able to do before. Maybe with strategy, maybe with some other things we're going to do in the way we won the, run the race. And that's exactly what we saw. They're that, about that close now. And if Max had continued, maybe it would have been a really interesting race strategy-wise. If Max had been leading and Carlos second and Max no brake problem, 
probably Carlos wouldn't have been able to run as long as he did, but we don't know. He might have just fallen back enough to keep the tyres clean. Max probably would have run as long as Carlos. Or maybe not, because even Max said before the start of the race that the deg rate on the Ferrari looks better than ours. So that would have been an interesting point. Um, Baris Sonal. Hi, Peter. Really enjoyed your recent comments on Senna brake testing. In that respect, who was naughtier in your opinion, Senna, Schumacher, Alonso? Uh, oh, Senna, for sure. Michael, was, Michael wasn't a brake tester. He was a T-boner. And I'm not saying that's any better, really, but it's kind of under braking and the car's a bit slower by then. And yeah, you're going for a gap that's rapidly closing and you're going from too far back and you shouldn't do it. Happens all the time. I, enjoy, I mean, George Russell used to do that in F3 all the time, GP3, whatever it was back then. And a little bit in F2 as well. Most really tough, hard race drivers do quite a bit of T-boning, Michael Schumacher style. I mean, that business of Michael bringing qualifying to a halt in Monaco by crashing the car deliberately. Uh, Felipe Massa may take note uh, if you're thinking about Singapore 2008. Um, you know, in that sense, Michael, I suppose, was going through new ground, but it wasn't dangerous. It was just really bad sportsmanship. Whereas Senna's stuff was super dangerous. And I don't want to speak ill about him because he's not with us, but I, I, I spoke to him about it, even in the Formula 3 days, about brake testing Robin and it, about Martin Brundle. His brother's called Robin. Used to race against him in metros, actually. And, and Etten would sort of shrug his shoulders and change the subject. And that was it. Um, he wouldn't defend it, really. And and he wouldn't deny it either. And and so that was it, was it was that mentality that Ayrton had of I'm the greatest racing driver in the world and I, nothing will stop me from winning this race and I will do anything it takes to win. Now that you could say that's an unbelievably powerful quality to have, but in his case, you know, it was super dangerous that stuff he did. As for Fernando, uh, yeah, a little bit like Michael. I think he's not, you know, what we saw him do with with Lewis in the pit lane in 07 in Hungary was a bit Michael-esque, wasn't it? That sort of Michael brought practice to our halt. Got to say, Nico Rosberg did a similar thing at Monaco, didn't he, when he won the championship and brought practice to a halt there. And and that's what's, what Fernando did with Lewis in the pit lane when they had to come in and it was a delay uh, and he just basically just held held Lewis up in the pit lane in qualifying. That's very... It's a, that was Michael. It, was, it wasn't super dangerous. It was just what can you say um it was just not a particularly comfortable thing to be doing from a sportsman teammate point of view it was it was perfidious it was it was something it was slightly something underhand about that and whereas and Ayrton was not political like that and he and he wouldn't he wouldn't stoop to things like that he would just do things at very high speed that was the difference i think and in my opinion, because brake testing is so dangerous, that was the naughtiest of the three. Um, that, to use your word, the naughtiest of the three. Lee Kambanga, do you think the media and TV, especially the big outlets, are spreading negativity in the sport right now because they have a big following, especially if their driver isn't doing well? It's a good point. I don't really watch the big outlets. So although I did watch the as I've been watching the Spanish one a little bit and I did make the point that it is incredible how biased they are towards Fernando not biased orientated towards Fernando and how little attention they pay to their other Spanish driver Carlos Sainz I just couldn't believe it I don't know why that is I mean you could say well you know Fernando's a double world champion Sainz isn't but surely you would imagine in Spain that Sainz is huge given his father's success and the way Carlos is anyway, he's a super cool guy, um, polite and humble and just a good bloke. And but yet the whole TV, it's as if, you know, the, it, all the stuff in the pit lane with their crew, it's all around Fernando. So I find that a bit odd. And I've, I've always said from years and years and years ago that um, nationalism, for me, it's always a double edged sword. It's a very quick way of getting views and fans but there was a, and there was a time when there were no spanish drivers and very little television rating numbers coming out of spain as a result and so bernie loved the idea of fernando alonso becoming a star and flavio briatore and bernie basically built him up from the Minardi days 
And look what it gave Bernie in terms of his Spanish TV numbers. You know, it was a great success. Michael with Germany as well. But the, the problem with that is that the fans are there to watch their guy and they're not there actually to watch Formula One. That's a difference. And I'm speaking as a purist and I'm speaking as a guy that I, you know, my heroes and the drivers that I've always loved over the years, nothing to do with my nationality or nationalities that I like. It's drivers and individuals and talents that I'm totally obsessed over. And, and so for me, I've never really understood that whole nationalism thing. Maybe it's because I'm a bit of a nomad. You know, I was born in England, grew up in Australia, lived in England, lived in the United States, live in Spain. I'm, I'm all over the place. And I just kind of appreciate life and people more than I do nationalities and beating the drum. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm as confused as you probably, Lee, about that whole business of, of spreading because you make a good point the minute your hero is doing well you shout and scream and that's the only thing that matters but when he's not doing well it will bring in an element of negativity into the way formula one is covered what can be done about that absolutely nothing i guess because it's 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 a bit like newspaper and uh, editors always wanting to have a negative story before a positive story and to have a quote even if it means misquoting they've got the quote for the big headline these days it's a bit like that with uh, covering the race you know the easy soft option the low-hanging fruit is always to go for the national hero and then the rest of the motor race and if the national hero is not doing very well and somebody else dominates the race yet again, you're going to be negative about it and say, oh, well, this is boring, isn't it? And that seeps through and it's sad because that means people are not appreciating Formula One in its entirety, in its depth, in all its layers. And, and that's a shame because there are so many layers. And as I said before, to me, there's, you know, it's all very well to do a, a show on Netflix about the drivers behind the scenes ostensibly although you know it's fairly contrived but if they're going to do that why aren't they doing that about the engineers and the mechanics and the motorhomers and the marshals and all the other people that are just as interesting in formula one and make them as big as big as player as as the drivers why not they've got the ability to do that and that's what i think they should do augusto hi peter could you talk a little bit about james hunt especially his 76 season I'd love to get your insights. Cheers and thanks for the lovely commentary. Well, thanks for the lovely question, Augusto. Um, James, yeah, lovely guy. Very, I mean, we went to Wellington College, which was one of the really upmarket English boarding schools. Very good at sport, cricket, rugger. Um, but like, he was a sort of one disheveled upper class Englishman that uh, didn't really have much money, even though he had this very upmarket education and say so there are many like that in the in the uk i don't know how many english viewers we got at the moment there are many many of them are like that and so he had this sort of slightly rough edge and he wouldn't be afraid to dig holes in the road for the fulham and hammersmith council which he did at fulham broadway for a couple of weeks to earn some quick money uh, equally um he probably spoke his reasonable amount of latin he could play the trumpet and uh he was a very good tennis player Wimbledon junior Wimbledon standard so you had this sort of two sides of James very rough diamond and this incredibly polished um, eloquent very funny person and he, he he just had this athletic ability to drive racing cars very very well and he knew that but he also had a temper as a lot of these boys do and and famously uh, he had that big incident at Crystal Palace in Formula 3 when he got nerfed off and he had to walk back and punch Dave Morgan. In the days of open, well, no, closed face helmet, but he definitely had a go at Morgan. Unlike Nelson, who, who hit Eliseo Salazar on the helmet, James actually went for the body, I think, from memory. So that caused quite a big thing. Hunt the Shunt, he was called, had quite a few of those. But then he did very quickly find a groove and working hard, really hard, never giving up, burning ambition. He, he got into a situation where he impressed Alexander Hesketh and the Dassel Formula 3 car and Bubbles Horsley. And they just loved James. And, and Lord Hesketh, a young uh, Lord Baronet, I think they are called, are they? I don't know. Anyway, it was a Lord, inherited Lord, just was besotted with James. And, and then then it began with Dave Beaky Sims in there. What a great team it was. And, and they built this Formula One car and went racing with James. And he was absolutely superb in that car. And he, and he, he won the Dutch Grand Prix, obviously. And he, 
he very nearly didn't get the McLaren drive. And it only happened because Emerson announced that he was switching to do his own team at back end of the year. And he jumps into this McLaren into the beginning of 76 with no testing and puts the car on the pole at Interlagos. Brilliant. Um, Nicholson engines. That was one of the main parts of that package. John Nicholson, New Zealander, who was quick, former Atlantic driver, drove a, built his own car called the Lynn car, L-Y-N-C-A-R, dark green with silver. Very quick car, but he was his main bread and butter business was rebuilding Cosworth DFE Formula One engines. And McLaren sort of nailed him down pretty early on to be for there to be their number one customer, his number one customer. And the Nicholson engine badge on the cam covers of the DFE became, you know, sort of a sign of power. And it was a lovely little logo, actually. I think from memory, he has a keyway on that as well. So the engines were good. Alistair Caldwell, Teddy Mayer, yeah, very good team. Gordon Coppock, McLaren M23 chassis, very good car, st very stiff for its time. And James just, you know, really quick at that point. So, yeah, I've been mean, going back to the Hesketh days, uh, the, day, the year before, 75. I remember at the German Grand Prix uh, Sunday morning, the, <laughs> I was parking the car, my car, and we all parked in the same car park in those days. And Hesketh turns up in his white 911, which he drove to most of the European races in Hesketh racing colours. Really nice 911. And the whole front of the car was stoved in. I said... Alexander, I think we I think we all got away with calling him Alexander. I said, Alexander, what happened to your 911? And he said, Oh, yes, last night, dinner at the Schloss somewhere at the Nürburgring. Um I was driving I was driving James, or well, James was driving me, I should say, and we had a bit of a bet about whether those bollards were made of foam or concrete. So the only way of verifying the winner was to crash test the car. <laughs> they were made of concrete. Uh, those were the days of, you know, that was what they mean when they talk about private, private owners, private entrants and drivers that got their opportunity through people like Lord Alexander Hesketh, who's still a great guy. I, had, I saw him relatively recently. He's brilliant. Uh, anyway, that 76 season, he and Nicky had been very good friends, not very good friends, but they had, there was a lot of mutual respect between Nicky and James prior to that 76 season because they were both with Marlborough and both very much uh, under the umbrella of John Hogan, who was the Marlborough guy, really good man as well. Sadly, no longer with us, lost him in COVID. And he, he kept the peace between the two and actually brought out the best between the two and actually had a lot of laughs with them, particularly in the Marlborough motorhome, Nicky and James and Watty in there periodically, but mainly Nicky and James. It was quite a lot of backgammon played, and 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 Nicky, I think, loved James's sense of humour, and and Nicky always, he's, it was all sort of British John Cleese humour was right up Nicky Street, and and James loved the sort of staccato uh, decision making of of Nicky and loved winding him up as a result. Um, the only really bad moment was when. At the Canadian Grand Prix, it was announced that James had lost the British Grand Prix under protest from Ferrari and that Nicky had therefore taken a big step forward in points. And that was, and John Hogan was the guy that had to sort of mediate at that point. And they were in the Holiday Inn, staying in the same Holiday Inn and had to sort of bring them to the same table in the coffee shop before they went to the track just to sort of talk to them and try to get them to be uh, relaxed. And... And he did a pretty good job, in all credit, John, I think. And uh, I remember chatting to James at that Canadian Grand Prix. It was one of the best drives he had that year. I think that win he had there was just outstanding. The way he used the traffic, there was a lot of pressure from Patrick Depay, I think, in the six-wheel Tyrrell. And, but James was just so good in traffic. It was sort of Sterling Moss-type masterclass on how to use the traffic to to just space yourself from the car behind an art that has gone from Formula One today because of GPS and all the business of you know, holding up another car. But uh, Sergio Perez, good example, three place grid penalty in the Australian Grand Prix. But I remember chatting to James before that race and I don't know how it happened, but we were sitting on the grass bank uh, by the, um, very near the grid on the run, just before the run into the first corner. and. 
And we were both just sitting there together and I'm saying to him, you know, so how, how do you feel about brands, James? And he was chatting away. And we chatted, I guess it must have been about five or six minutes. And he suddenly looked at his watch and he said, goodness, is that the time? I must get my man to start my engine. And ran off to the grid to get into his car, to get his man to start his engine. Uh, that's how James was. I mean, he, in 19, 1940, he would have been, God, is that the time? I've got to get into my Spitfire and go and do some flying. He would have been a... He would have been in the Battle of Britain, absolutely. He would have been at the front of the queue to get into a Spitfire. Uh, yeah, and I knew James's brother very well, Peter, and his younger brother, J uh, David, as well. Very good friend. So sadly, we've lost both of them now. But uh, fond memories, very fond memories of that time. And we shouldn't forget that James also did the Grand Prix Night of the Stars before the British Grand Prix, which was the first race taken over by Bernie, interestingly, the 76 British Grand Prix at Brands Hatch. And there was all that stuff going on and, you know, all the furore about the start. So what a race for Bernie to have as, a, as his first race, if you like. And that was preceded by the Grand Prix Night of the Stars, which Andrew Marriott and Barry Gill and um, Michael T, uh, CSS, put together it was an incredible thing at the Albert Hall, which he doesn't get any bigger than the Albert Hall in London in terms of a concert venue. And it was basically to raise money, a charity thing. And all the many of the Grand Prix drivers were there. Bruce Forsyth was the was the compare. And, it, and it's a, there's a video on YouTube. You should watch it. Because at one point, Bruce says something like, He's introduced James and he says, James, I, I think he says, oh, I hear he used to play the trumpet or something. And James says, yeah, That's right. Oh, well, let's hear you play something then. And then the sort of Albert Hall goes into a hush because they're thinking they're not really going to ask James Hunt to play the trumpet solo in front of a packed Albert Hall, are they? And he did. He did this, this wonderful rendition of Purcell's trumpet voluntary. Da, 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 da. And the whole place was absolutely silent. You can hear a pin drop between James's notes. And then everybody just stood up and it was rapturous applause you know, for, a, for a Formula One driver in his championship year to do something like that way away from his normal world still it still makes my the, the hairs on my arm stand up uh, just amazing um, 76 also I was I was standing in the Ferrari garage at Monza in the rain on Friday when Nicky went out for the first time since the Nürburgring accident because Carlos was was making his Ferrari debut and I was very close to Carlos at that point and Nicky was very unhappy about Carlos being in that car didn't want him bit like bit like Lewis with George Russell but anyway um, I was because of that I was in the Ferrari garage and and the first run Nicky did I remember him coming in and he's still wearing an AGV helmet can you believe the one that had come off in the accident still wearing that same type of helmet not that helmet quite obviously but he still had on the, the Marlborough jacket that he'd had at the Nürburgring because he had the Marlborough tape over it, which he didn't need to do at Monza. I remember thinking, wow, that's the same jacket he had on at the Nürburgring. Anyway, he took off his helmet after that first run and there was blood on the balaclava. And that left an impression big time. So that was 76. Yeah. Um, Alessandro Durango. Ciao, Peter. Watching Charles struggling with the car's setup. It seems that he lacks the support of his race engineer. Anyway, I'm sure he'll come back stronger in Suzuka. I didn't see that. I was out there. I didn't see him struggling with the setup. I, see him strugg I saw him struggling with his driving. And I think he was just overdriving that car on those super soft Pirellis. I think if the range of Pirellis had been stiffer and harder, not stiffer, harder, the normal range, in other words, I don't think Charles would have had the same problems. And, and for some reason, Carlos just read that perfectly and got it right. And the minute Carlos was in the groove and quick, Charles was completely shocked and started overdriving the car and, and, and putting too much heat in the tyres, particularly sector two, and then crushing the sidewalls as a result. And, and that's what we saw. We saw Charles Leclerc not doing a very good job with a car that was very well set up and actually a very good racing car, good enough to be on the front row in Charles' hands on a perfect lap, probably good enough to take the pole. And he didn't because Carlos did such a good job. So I saw a very different thing there. I don't think that setup was um, a problem for Charles. I think he had a good car. He just didn't, 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 he was completely discombobulated by the compound range that Pirelli brought, whereas Science wasn't. Um, Walter Harmsen, 
Hi, Peter. I know there's an engine. I was going to say antifreeze, but it's just freeze, isn't it? But I was wondering, could the teams crank up the engine if they wanted to? The engine exists with so many components. How does the FAA check this? Now, they have certain um, modes and maps they can run, but they're all within the limitations of what you can do with the engine in terms of the fuel, you know, everything else, the fuel flow, the mixtures, everything else. But they can, they obviously have different settings that they can give the engine in various situations, whether it be the wet, qualifying, whatever. Um, but it's pretty much frozen. And, and you've got to, you know, I, I keep going on about Mercedes getting blown away by their customer team. So the reality is the engines are all the same. So what, what we're really saying is that the Mercedes chassis is getting blown away by the McLaren and Aston Martin chassis because the engines are the same. But having said that, of course, Mercedes can be the first to decide that they want to have a slightly different architecture at the back, as Ferrari did with theirs in terms of where they're going to put the intercool, as indeed Red Bull have with, with their rb20 as well so they do have a little bit of an advantage but yeah everything's very frozen and there's not much you can do overall you can have different setups of the engine that the drivers can adjust in the cockpit but um but not much else and so what we have now is what we've got till the end of 2025 in terms of engine performance i don't think it's that much i mean the, the alpines are so bad at the moment it's very difficult to say how good or bad the renault engine specifically is but i think ferrari versus mercedes versus red bull powertrain honda then i think they're pretty much much of a muchness speaking of red bull powertrain honda very impressed uh that phil pru is now running that really good guy top man one of the great engineers, you know, Lewis, and before that, Kimi at McLaren. And sort of his counterpoint was Mark Slade, who was running DC at that time. And and they were just a great pair of race engineers. Mark is still in Formula One working for Kevin Magnussen, doing a great job. And Phil went to Mercedes powertrain, and now he's just heading, and now he's heading up Red Bull powertrain. So anybody that thinks that the Ford Red Bull powertrain power unit won't be super good in 26 think again because you know phil's a good man good good man manager and a very good man technically as well um ma khan hi peter you were the only person that talked about the improvements carlos made 18 months ago what did you notice that others did not commentators are now picking upon what you've been saying <laughs> well thank you ma khan that's very kind of you to say that I'm not sure if that's the case, but certainly 18 months ago, to my eye, Carlos had got to the point where with his style of driving, with his longer corners, the only way he was going to be at his maximum on a qualifying lap was by breaking absolutely as late as possible, getting the turn in absolutely perfect, and then getting the power on at exactly the right rate. In other words, doing what Etten Senna used to do. That's because a similar radius of corner that they like to take and, the, and prior to 18 months ago he was always breaking either breaking a fraction too late or maybe turning the steering a fraction too uh, violently and the back end would go or he would maybe it would be a change of direction corner he would overload the car and he wasn't able to get the change of direction he needed for the exit something like that would happen which is all a function of ultimately having to break super super low, late and having a lot of load on the car as you've got to do as your platform approaches and then what seemed to be happening to me 18 months ago was that he had he'd started to appreciate that the only way he was going to survive and be, get in any sort of groove would be backed off slightly from all of those things i've just described and just just softened everything a fraction and left a little bit of margin everywhere then he would have more speed that he could sustain over a longer period of time and and that's what he's been doing ever since i think he's been really disciplined in not trying to break super late and not trying to get the power on super early he's just letting the car tell him what it needs what he's not done is start to drive like charles and, and shorten the corners and because he's he's never done that and so for him, he thinks i think for him to start doing that now at this stage of his career would be a negative step probably although an interesting point and i'm thinking as i speak if he does have to sort of write off 2025 in a way that would be a good year for him to sort of rebuild his style a little bit and just capitalize on everything he's just done 
but then shorten his corners because he definitely has long corners. He uses more road over a, over a race distance than Charles Leclerc, no question about it. But he definitely has the ability to do that. And I hope he, and it sounds condescending, but I hope he does. I hope he, you know, if he has a bad year in 25 because there's nowhere to go apart from plug in Mercedes drive or a Sauber drive, then that would be a good year for him to rebuild his, some of his repertoire, actually. But I think mentally he's also benefited a lot from his dad uh, in these times, in these last 18 months. I'm sure his dad has been a very calming influence on back yourself, sort of Steve War type thing. You know, back yourself, Carlos, do what you do well, but don't keep making errors. You've got to find a way of not making these errors. And, and I think he did that. And sometimes he bemuses Charles, you know, because Charles, I'm sure, doesn't really think of Carlos Sainz as a genuine competitor. But sometimes Carlos goes really quickly, and as we saw in Melbourne, and Charles doesn't really know how to react. And he just said, oh, well, I'll go even quicker because I'm quicker. And in this case, he overused the tyres. So, yeah, that's what, that's what we did. Uh, Portrait Mailer. I just saw a clip of Nigel Mansell passing out from trying to push his car over the finish line in Dallas. Dallas Rally 84. It wasn't a rally. It was the actual US Grand Prix in Dallas. Street circuit, unbelievably hot. Race started at 11 in the morning because it was going to be so hot at 1. And the pre-race warm-up, which we used to have in those days on Sunday morning, was at something like 6 in the morning. Yeah, Nigel did that. Characteristically, I mean, what Nigel did there was no different from what he did in his first Grand Prix in Austria 1980 when he was in the third Lotus 81B. Not a good car at all. And but it was his first Grand Prix and, the, and he had a fuel leak in the car and the fuel was just all over him and he was suffering quite bad burns. And he just kept going, kept going until something happened with the car, the engine blew or something. But he did at least two thirds of the race. That was Nigel and is Nigel today even. You know, he's a sort of hero Biggles type figure that, you know, if you're in the trenches, he's the guy that will be first out of the trenches for sure. And he's the guy you want on your side, as a matter of fact, in any battle or war. And... And that what he did there was no different. A lot of people think Nigel did a lot of that stuff for show. And to some extent he did, but it wasn't, wasn't for show in the way that I think many people perceive sh the word show. In other words, the way show is embellished by social media and stardom. What Nigel did it was to show the world how hard he, how, how committed he was to his life and to his job in racing. And, and it was like, okay, now I've got to, got to get through this pain barrier now and and the business of telling everybody about it afterwards came as a result of nobody taking any interest in him for at least 50 60 percent of his career when you can't say that about any other great grand prix driver he was just sort of flushed away down the toilet as a guy that was never going to make it and i suppose when you know things did happen to him he wanted people to know because he was a big tough racing driver that could rule the world. That's the way he got out of bed in the morning. That's why he was that good. And Dallas, yeah, the thing stopped and he started to push it and it was incredibly hot. And it got a lot of headlines. He didn't do it for that reason, but it got a lot of headlines. He was annoyed in that race because he could have won that race actually, but he, there, were, there was a big issue about the tires and how they were gonna perform in that heat. And he was having quite an early battle with Keki. I remember Keki was in the Williams FW09, not a great car, but Keki doing a very good job in that car with the first cooling suit ever to appear in Formula One. So he was happy as Larry in the car. And, but Nigel was wanting to not go that quickly and not overuse the tires and, and, and kept sort of backing off at appropriate moments, hoping that Keki would read what he was doing. And Keki didn't read it. He just saw Nigel as being fairly inconsistent and started passing him. And, and Nigel think, what is Keki doing here? We're trying to slow the race down. And I remember, Afterwards, there was quite a lot of confusion about, uh, about that. And Nigel, interestingly, I've got, I was going through my pictures the other day, and there's a picture of him doing the, what was the equivalent of today's Thursday track walk. It was probably a Wednesday track walk back then. And he's um, by the side of the road with Steve Hallam, looking at the curbs and the walls and stuff. And the car they've just got out of is a DeLorean. <laughs> Amazing, eh? Thought you'd be interested in that. Um, Vic Neswari, Vicky, hi, hi. That's a good one. Um, right. 
Now I'm in great danger of losing my place here. But anyway, here we go. I can do it that way. Hi, Peter. Why is Pross being looked at as a villain? Is he? Mansell Senna was shown as people who didn't want him as a teammate. I might be wrong. To me, he is calm, collected, methodical and short corners. He's definitely collected, calm, methodical and short corners. You're 100% right there. Uh, well, Mansell Senna didn't want anybody, like any great Grand Prix driver, like Max Verstappen, as I've hopefully kind of explained over the years, uh, well, over the last few years anyway on these live streams, my my understanding and my knowledge of all of these super quick drivers is none of them ever want to have, if they can help it, a super quick driver in the other car. They want a guy that's quick enough to do the job if there's a problem with the number one driver's car, to do a lot of the donkey work back at base, to do a lot of the donkey work with the sponsors and allow them, the greatest racing driver in the world, to go out and win the world championship. That's what they want. So in Nigel's case, he didn't get that until he got Ricardo Patrese in 1991. Before that, he had uh, Keki Rosberg, who was really quick, Nelson Piquet, who was really quick, um, Alan Prost, who was really quick, and then he got Ricardo. So he always had an Elio De Angelis and Mario, of course, when he was at Lotus. So he always had somebody mega quick in the other car. And when he, when he decided to go back to Williams, he did say to Frank, and I was kind of encouraging him, you know, I'm only going to do it if I've got somebody cool in the other car like Ricardo. That's what I want. And then I'll do the job for you, Frank. And don't forget, Frank turned down Honda engines for 1988. He was winning races in the championship in 87 with Honda. He turned them down because Honda wanted Nakajima in the other car in 88. And the only driver that he could replace was Nelson Piquet because Nigel was already signed for two years. So Frank thought Mansell, Nakajima, nah, no way, no way we can win a championship with that combination. I'm going to tell Honda to go away. And it was a mistake because for sure, I think Nigel would have won the championship. We certainly would have won a lot of races in 88. Whether he would have beaten McLaren's another matter, but uh, Senna and Prost, but he would have been right up there with a the Honda engine in 88 for sure. But Frank just never imagined that Nigel was that good. But he was, and that's part of the issue. Going back to the other thing, um, Senna didn't want Prost. Well, Senna, for exactly like Max Verstappen, wouldn't want George Russell or Charles Leclerc or Lewis Hamilton in the other Red Bull. He, he'd want Sergio Perez, maybe Carlos Sainz, pro probably okay with Lando Norris, probably wouldn't want Oscar Piastri. Uh, he'd, pro he'd be okay with Pierre Gasly. You know, they want that sort of level of driver. Gerhard Berger was a good number two for Senna. He's probably very happy with Berger. He's equivalent of sort of Lando Norris level. But he wouldn't have wanted Prost because Prost was very good and did some things that, as you say, he's short corners, which Etten was not. And, and he didn't want that guy in the other car. So it wasn't Prost specifically. It was somebody as quick as Prost that they didn't want. It just happened that in both cases they had dramas with Prost. Senna with Prost in 88, obviously. Uh, well, all the time he was with him, even when he was at Ferrari, had problems with him. Um, but that was a different thing. That was more of a blessed thing. And then um, the same with Nigel. It, it, Prost happened to be the driver that Frank decided he wanted for 93 to replace Ricardo, And so it became, you know, a Prost thing. But it wasn't so much a Prost thing as a, just a, a driver like of Prost's Ilk, that's what it was. Um, Marina Nora Rodriguez. Hi, Peter. Hope you had a beautiful time in Melbourne. Did you get to talk to Charles, Lewis or Max? I got to say hi to all of them, but not to ask them really deep, penetrating questions. But I did speak to their minions quite a lot when they when I was sort of hying to Charles or hying to Lewis. Actually, I saw Lewis at the back of the garages just before the race. And... Um, and Max, yeah, well, actually, at fairness, I don't think I did see Max uh, other than just a sort of high like that and sort of one of those. But it wasn't, um, it was just so many people around him all the time, as there are with, you know, these days when it's the uh, the guy. As you know, I'm not very good when there's a lot of crowds and people everywhere with jumping around. I tend to want I mean, I had some great, great conversations, actually, with... Um, you know, engineers, mechanics hadn't seen for quite a while. They, you know, those are the things that you can only get at a race. Just wonderful to see them and get their input on various things. Stewards, all sorts of people. Um, so I'm quite sure how to make this work now, Marina. You're asking another question. Okay, I'll just do this. 
uh, sorry here we go put it up there we go and then I have to get rid of that um, beautiful victory by Carlos but sad to hear people saying that Ferrari fired the wrong driver that Charles is overrated and that Lewis is finished so so smart of you to stay away from the social media well a beautiful win by Carlos definitely people jumping on the bandwagon without really having not really understanding really Formula One I suppose is the right thing Ferrari fired the wrong driver well I've kind of been saying the natural order of things is that Carlos should be at this point negotiating his new contract with Ferrari so in a way I don't think they should have fired either driver it's not the wrong driver they shouldn't have fired either driver but somewhere up there as I say probably at the Alcon level they decided that they needed well they decided that Lewis would be a too good a opportunity to turn down Charles overrated nah, I think he overdrove not overrated he overdrove for one race on the on the range of Pirelli's that he had because he was a bit sort of messed up in his head by the speed of Carlos Sainz on the same range of compounds and that's a, that was an error that comes under the heading of ah Charles Leclerc we thought he'd stop making errors like this and now he's made another error so yep he put that down to not a good race for Carlos Sainz for Charles Leclerc in my view but um, but you know nobody's perfect all the time I, Charles had more imperfect situations and races than most of the, of the really top guys but it's certainly not he's certainly not overrated I mean who I, I rate him very very highly I, just, I, I don't really bother with that social media stuff Lewis finished I mean anybody that thinks Lewis is finished has no clue about Formula One driving or drivers or people because as I said I, I don't think Lewis consistently over a year is going to drive a bad car with high speed flick oversteer on the absolute limit every lap in that sense he's not probably the Lewis that he was back in the beginning of his career but I think in a good car with good balance good set of tires good calm approach to the race I think he's going to be as quick as he always was and therefore quite capable of winning Grand Prix on any given Sunday absolutely for sure and he'll be right now be very buoyed by Ferrari won't he DLKR hi Peter I love your show exclamation mark thank you very much thank you DLKR I wanted to say thank you for not participating in all the clickbaity drama that other channels degrade to your love for Formula One shines through in every show thank you very much it's very kind I'm now going to try and be very optimistic and go to a super chat I say optimistic in the hope that I can get back to where I was uh, this is a very very kind <coughs> excuse me super chat from okay um Okay, Yilmaz. Okte Yilmaz. Thank you very much. Okte. Hi, Peter. Do you think Shumi's first retirement was early? I always thought like that and really heartbroken when he did that. Also, do you think it was all about Montezemolo? You know, it's a good question. When I was talking to Felipe Massa not so long ago, and Felipe said that, that Michael actually said to him, I'm going to retire, and I'm th therefore, and it was sort of the second part of the sentence, your Ferrari driver's safe. And... I've often thought about that whether Michael would actually had the offer to stay which I'm sure he did but decided not to take it because he'd become very fond of Felipe and he there were a number of reasons he did want to retire the family whatever uh, and felt that because it was going to give Felipe that chance at Ferrari the, the real chance at Ferrari then he was going to retire it's a sweet thought isn't it if he did it if that was part of his motivation I can only think that it was mainly family driven Mick starting to be show a lot of interest in carts Michael having achieved a lot and knowing that he had a great career ahead of him in terms of whatever he wanted to do in life and a bit of the Felipe thing I don't think Montezemolo played a massive role in the sense of saying Michael your days are done it's time for you to hang up your helmet I don't believe Montezem I know, know Luca pretty well and I just don't think he would have done that I think he would have been very uh, logical with Michael about Michael's potential earning power and what he could do post racing career so yeah it's a little bit like um, it's a little bit like Carlos actually in 78 when Ferrari said to Carlos your new teammate is Jody Schechter um, but we want you to sign a new two-year contract and he a didn't really want to have Schechter in the other car because he knew it would be 
it would cramp his style in the way I've just been describing in that previous answer. And also he felt, he, he was very fond of Gilles at that point. And he just thought, you know, if I leave, it's a bad thing for Gilles. He'll probably go to McLaren or somewhere, not very good. And I, and I remember one of the first things he did was go to Gilles and said, Gilles, you're okay at Ferrari, I'm leaving. And, and I, that meant as, almost as much to Carlos as not wanting to drive with Jody. Interesting, isn't it? Okay, back to the general flow of things. Sarosh Soman. Rob Wilson, here we go, uses passenger cars for driver coaching. The feeling of surface will not be direct as race car interested to know how I can develop feeling for the surface of the road in a car. Well, you say that, there's no way Rob could drive the laps or indeed the guys that he's with could drive the laps unless you were feeling the surface of the road. So the surface of the road is always insulated by tires, brakes, the chassis, the car. It's not as if a racing car, you're actually touching the road. So you're always feeling things through the steering wheel and the pedals and the seat and the small of your back and your shoulders. That's where you're feeling things, regardless of what sort of car you're driving. That's the first point. So I don't actually agree with the lack of surface of the road. And, and of course, what actually driving a racing car really well at the Rob Wilson level is all about is managing the dynamic weight of the car constantly moving dynamic weights all around the car as it's starting to go into a corner and it's it's balancing all those dynamic weights in such a way that you're shortening the corner you're getting a perfect rotation and a perfectly a straight exit as you can possibly have very very difficult to achieve very difficult to achieve in a road car very difficult to achieve in a racing car but the principles are absolutely no different and that's why he uses a road car because there's a lot of practical advantages a it's repeatable B, you don't need to wear a helmet. C, you don't need to wear overalls and stuff. You don't wear driving shoes probably, but otherwise you can talk, you can you can feel all these things. And, and I say all this absolutely with confidence because I've been on a number of days with Rob when he's been with frontline Grand Prix drivers who have said, wow, I know exactly what you mean now. And that's not what, what I'm doing in the race car, but I will, I'm gonna try and work on that. And equally engineers sitting in the back seat while it's going on saying, oh, yeah, that, that explains what was going on last week at Imola, Joe, whatever. And everything is directly reproducible. And the proof of that is that Adrian Newey does quite a lot of work with Rob Wilson, so or has done. And to, to, so he can get a real, under, a real understanding of how to manage the dynamic weights. And to me, it's still astonishing that, that racing drivers aren't queued up to do that stuff with Rob because I don't know anybody else in the world that can do it as well as he does, explain it as well as he does in a road car <laughs> the way he does. It's not complicated. If you, the minute you start bringing high performance cars in, the minute you start having it on a proper racetrack, uh, which requires marshals and everything else, the minute it becomes a difficult thing to do three times a week. But he's got it down to a very fine art. And I, would, I think it behoves anybody who's remotely interested in driving well to do stuff with Rob Wilson. And I'm right now I'm working with, not working, I'm talking to one of the team principals about how to get his two drivers to do some stuff with Rob. He knows that it's an issue because the drivers today are so into fitness and the engineers and the telemetry that most of them feel that they've got very little use of use for um, a drive, you know, a road car stuff. They just don't think it can help them, but they're wrong. They're definitely wrong in my opinion. Um, so another another one's come up, I think. Matthew Brown, thank you very much. Another super chat. Uh, Hi, Peter. How impressive was it that Max was able to keep up with Carlos, even with a stuck brake disc? Also, your opinion on the fans cheering for Max's retirement to each their own, I guess. Yeah, I'm not into all that fan cheering. And it was literally, I mean, we were directly opposite the grandstands. It was literally like a football stadium when when Carlos was obviously passing Max and then when Max retired. It's not nice, is it? It's like clapping a double fault at Wimbledon. Not done. <laughs> of course, it is done these days. That's the trouble, isn't it? Um, I think, I don't think Max had it all the time. I think Max, he definitely felt it on the outlaps onto the grid. And on, I know he said later it all happened at the start, but he definitely was feeling it on the outlaps. A, he told a friend of mine that that was the case. And B, um, he came into the garage from the first outlap 
and immediately they were checking under the right rear and they jacked it up and they took it into the garage briefly and there's a guy under the car looking and then he went out again. So I, I, you know, he definitely felt something on that outlap. And then at the start, I, th I just think those first two or three laps, it was coming and going until suddenly, obviously, it bound on completely. And, you know, I've been banging on about brakes all weekend. Uh, and I had been banging on brakes ever since Charles Bahrain issues and talking about in my brain trying to understand what that was all about because quite clearly it wasn't debris in the brake ducts in, in Bahrain with, with Charles because if it was they would have told us because nobody's scared of admitting that they've got debris in a brake duct. The fact that Ferrari wanted to keep it very quiet and, and you'd even talk to other suppliers nothing to do with Ferrari who'd say oh no we, we can't talk about that. I just thought you know there is something weird going on here and the more I spoke about it, spoke to people about it, and the more I looked up and down the pit lane during the FP1 and FP2 and saw the Brembo guys' teams changing brakes and stuff, seemingly the same brakes, just different batches, it was pretty clear to me that there's some thought that the batches, one batch of discs to another, are slightly different. And the teams are trying to get on top of which batches do which. Not that any is wrong. It's just they're different and they therefore have different setups around them. And I think that's what happened. I still think that's probably what happened. I think obviously something broke, whether it be some sort of um, brake line connector, something like that obviously broke. But I think it broke because there was something not quite right with the, with the disc against the caliper. And I think that's possibly due to some sort of manufacturing batch. And if you ask Brembo, or Brembo proactively react, which they have, saying that's nothing to do with us, our brakes were perfect, I think you'd say, well, that would be the case, wouldn't it? Because they've, they've got this batch of discs, they're looking at them, yeah, correctly manufactured, everything's perfect, the measurements, all this, exactly the right material, can't be that, it's not this, it's not that coupling, it's not that, must be the setup of the car. But if it is one batch to another, how are they going to do that unless you do a lot of back-to-backs, which is what the teams are trying to do on that Friday. And I've got a big if here. Uh, one of our questions also said a, an if and it's a big if and I have to say the same thing absolutely for sure because I'm only kind of looking at the evidence that I could see from the outside and um, but that's what it looked like to me. I don't see how why all those teams would be working so hard on looking at the different batches of disc manufacture if there wasn't something going on since since Bahrain, or well, as a result of what we saw in Bahrain. And, 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 and I think also on that point, I know from people on Carlos Sainz's side of the garage, they think, they say they've had the same issues as Charles and, and Carlos has sort of driven through them. This is the Bahrain issue, driven through them and eventually they went away as it did with Charles when he was really quick at the end of the race. And kind of what's the big deal sort of thing. We know that there's been these issues and we just live with it which is what you would say if it is a batch thing because not much you can do about it except know which batch is going to do what. It's not a, I'm, not, I'm not in any way criticizing Brembo here because I think it probably applies to any supplier and maker of parts. Nothing is ever identical whether it be engines. You know, Every engine is slightly different. Every brake disc is probably slightly different and so if you're trying to get it down to a batch it gives you more control of what's going to do, how this is going to react in certain situations. Um, I think this is the next question. I've, it's just gone through a massive scrolling thing here. If the, just so you all know what I'm going on about here, I've got the sort of open box of questions in front of me, but it um, uh, now what's happened? I've just tried to make it larger and it's completely gone black. Um, and the problem is after you, after I have about six questions, the whole thing just freezes and I can't get to can't get it to move anyway. Um, Marwan Fares, hi Peter, is science to Red Bull not a no-brainer? Ferrari will likely be closest to Red Bull in 25 and you want the strongest pairing possible as the field converges. Why hasn't he put pen to paper? Well, I'm sure he would put pen to paper if he was offered the paper. If you look at it from Red Bull's point of view, yes, Perez was very disappointing in Melbourne. Shouldn't have got the three-place grid penalty. Well, would they blame them, him for that? I think it was also team information on there so it wasn't probably all his fault that impeding thing with Nico Hulkenberg in Q1 so they would probably give him the benefit of the doubt there three place grid penalty difficult but then he was pretty hopeless in the race wasn't he He should have beaten at least one if not two McLarens in a Red Bull RB20 let's face it but he didn't and so that was disappointing 
But then you look at it from the other side of the point of view, other point of view. He's finished second in the other two races. He's probably going to win a race or two this year. He brings quite a lot of money from Mexico. He knows the team. Max is happy with him. And therefore, Adrian's happy as him as a number two. And he does quite good work with the sponsors back at the factory. Now, Carlos is probably quicker, but probably doesn't bring any money with him. And is he going to beat Max more than, is he going to give Max more trouble than Sergio does? That's the big question. And you'd probably say, well, he probably is because he's quicker. So is that what we really want with Max anyway? We're not looking for the fastest driver we can get in the other car. We're looking for if Ferrari are going to be really good in 25, we want to make sure that Max scores every conceivable point he can have and doesn't have any points taken away by his teammate because that's what we're going to need to do to beat Ferrari for Max Verstappen to be world champion. And if he's world champion, there's half a chance we'll win the Constructors' Championship. Perez isn't that slow. We may not, but if we don't win the Drivers' Championship, it's a big problem. And despite what you might hear recently about the Constructors' Championship being so important, the reality is the, the Drivers' Championship is just as important, if not more important, in terms of the prestige and the money involved that it brings in from the winning driver to, to the team and the sponsorship. So I don't think it is a no-brainer. And I think, I think Red Bull would, would think, yeah, we really must think about having Carlos back. But then it would mean sacking Sergio Perez, who's probably doing the job that they want him to do. That's the issue. You know, Carlos is doing the job they wanted to do him at Ferrari and they're getting rid of him. So maybe they will. Maybe you're right. But then again, from Carlos's point of view, to finish it, it's not a great thing for Carlos, is it? He's, he's been at Ferrari doing a really good job alongside Charles Leclerc now, winning races and loving the team and he fits in well he goes to red bull it's going to be difficult for him to do the same job at red bull beating max verstappen as often he beats as often as he beats charles leclerc that's not going to happen so it won't actually be at that happier time for, for carlos if he is there number two at red bull and he will be a number two for sure if it's adrian and max still there so it's not that obvious really i don't think Haley gilbert Always been so fascinated with Beloff. Could you talk a bit about his driving style and what makes him so thoroughly respected by his peers? Um, well, I know Martin Brundle respected him uh, a lot. That's probably what you mean, and correctly so. Yeah, very fluid, very soft inputs. I remember watching him in the wet in the Maurer F2 car at Silverstone, and he was just fabulous, you know, using all the, using the outside line finding the grip completely naturally everything was fingertippy and just that's how he drove he, and martin did too but beloff a little bit more than martin yeah and he was a little bit you know he was he could just he was a bit like mika hakkinen you know he could just whatever situation the car was in you knew that beloff was going to be able to 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 make something good out of it and it would probably invo involve really good use of the back of the front of the car incredible car control he was out of the car really nice guy very polite very charming a bit of a francois sever in a way uh, and his sadly his accident was being nerfed off so it was nothing to do with lack of car control or anything like that it was just it hit another car a uh, rouge but yeah just a uh, ronnie peterson i would say nearest in style really to to belloff Ronnie was very soft as well, very fingertippy, oversteer. Jean-Pierre Jarrier, Tom Price, yeah, that ilk, that's that style of driver, lovely, lovely to watch. Really good guy too. Um, Nigel King, George has had a few late race crashes in the past. Was George going too fast into that corner anyway? Thank you. <laughs> Poor George. I don't think so. No, I think George just was he was definitely thrown by what fernando was doing fernando wasn't brake testing him he was just you know faffing around and by fernando's admission he got it wrong which is why he sort of upshifted and or well, downshifted and then upshifted again because he felt he'd come gone a bit too slowly into the corner which is an incredible admission for somebody of fernando alonso's stature but anyway what fernando was trying to do was just sort of slow george up mid corner and george would have been kind of okay with that i think because that's what you can do and there's nothing to stop you doing that and i think he was just thrown by fernando's error of sort of breaking a little bit too early and emphasis on the braking he wasn't braking while he was flat out just 
deciding to get into the corner a bit too early and deciding he go a little bit quicker um, and probably hoping that George was a bit sort of confused by it all and it was all above board so far as Fernando was concerned. Going back to George, I did make the point that if you're George Russell, you should spend as much time, I think, not as much time, you should spend a lot of time, not George, everybody in Formula One should spend a lot of time looking at videos of old films and races and learning about the guys on the grid and how they drive and things they've done in the past so you build up this this book of in your brain of oh fernando did that in the past he's quite capable of doing that again and this is what lance stroll does and this is what kevin magnuson does so when i come up to pass kevin i need to know that i'll remember that he does this or that and that's his weak point and you so you build up this sort of identity kit of every driver and what their style is some drivers do that naturally and i think that's one of the great things lewis was able to do very early on in his formula two career probably formula three career maybe started in formula two after that incident with premat at barcelona in formula three but uh he started to read other drivers really well and and did in formula one does in formula one read them very well which is one of the reasons he's kept out of trouble a lot even when he hasn't been on the front row in the last couple of years i'm not sure george the next generation think that way they probably think you know the rule book defines what you can do and I'll drive on the limit of what the rule book allows me to do and I'm George Russell and I'm super quick and I'll pass if there's a gap do, has George Russell ever spent any time watching that great epic battle between Michael and Fernando at Imola I don't know I'd like to think he has I think they all have but I doubt it I doubt it but if he had he might be thinking when he was following Fernando it could have been good information for him and I wonder whether the engineers or the team principal of these teams remind their drivers that it's a good thing to do that and to have as much homework as possible on what, uh, on what the guy you're racing against potentially can do. That's what I think we saw there. Um, all right, next question, please. Where are we going now? That one we've had. Um, George and his late race crashes had that one. There's a big sign saying clear, which I'm very, very loath to press in case it deletes all the questions that you've all asked. But I'm wondering whether clear is the right thing to press when I try to get this thing unfrozen. Um, Pavel Rebeg, I think he's replying to somebody else, says, yeah, well, Lewis still didn't win that championship. What's he talking about here? 21, I guess. Um, Michael V says he's racing for how many million dollars? I think it's all ch you chatting amongst yourselves, I think. De Gea, United fan first. Don't care about Senna, 89, Hill, 90. Oh, well, it's done. Massey paid the price. It's enough. Move on. Um, Adrian Rader. Hi, Peter. Just to follow on from prior question, re your familiarity with Bernie. Could you perhaps shed some light on his business acumen tactics? How was he as a businessman? Well, that would take an entire show. <laughs> but I would say this. Possibly like Donald Trump, although uh, quite often I hear Trump saying something. I think that oh, sounds like Bernie. That's what he would say. Um, anyway, in answer to your question, and I began it by saying a bit like Donald Trump, Bernie that struck me. The thing about Bernie was, yes, he was a very, very sharp, clever businessman. In other words, he, he could always think of the end game while you're still at phase one, even though there were going to be 27 phases before you got to the end game, he would already know what the end game was. And so he could play it really well. He's very good at, um, believe it or not, by acting and intimidation and certainly by choreography, certain things happening at certain times. You know, it might be telling his secretary to ring him on his desk phone at a certain time when Bernie knew that it was going to be the moment that he had to leave the guy the other side of the desk to go and think about what Bernie had just said and things like that always always on top of the choreography but most of all the the overriding overriding characteristic of bernie as a businessman in my opinion was that as if there was a deal out there he wanted the deal and he knew exactly what price he could have the deal for or how much money he wanted to make but if he couldn't get the deal for whatever reason he was just as motivated as stopping other people from having the deal if he couldn't have it that's a very important point. And I think that colours a lot of what we've seen from Bernie over the years. Just as motivated in stopping others from having a deal that he, could, that he wanted and couldn't, couldn't get. And that sort of dual motivation has confused a lot of people over time. And they've often wondered about why Bernie's done certain things or said certain things. And it, and it kind of explains why 
team principals over the years have gone to Bernie uh, in the build up to the Monaco Grand Prix and said, Bernie, I've got the CEO of American Express coming to the race and I'd love to get a pass for him on the grid to introduce him to some of the celebrities and, and uh, you know, he'd be great for Formula One. He might sponsor our team and imagine if American Express are in Formula One. And Bernie's reaction is, he's not my sponsor, he's your sponsor. I'm not going to help you at all. Why do I want to do that? Go away. And if, if, the, if the team principal was saying, Bernie, I've got a sponsor for you, for signage, for the circuit, for the title of the race, whatever it is, of course you get the pass, no problem. But he's never been interested in, he was never interested in helping teams with their sponsors because how is Bernie benefiting from that personally? So that's something a lot of people never understood. They often said, oh, but it's good for the sport, good for Formula One. And Bernie said, how's it good for Formula One? It's not good for me. How can it be good for Formula One? And they never got that. So Jackie Stewart always got it. He always, Jackie, never took a sponsor into Formula One without sharing it with Bernie. And he did it really well. Heineken, Rolex. But a lot of the others tried and failed. One of the funniest stories I ever heard, well, I thought it was funny anyway, um, was, uh, I better not mention his name because he probably won't appreciate me dropping him in it, but it was the guy that handled the Sega sponsorship I guess Williams 90, what, 93, around there. And, and after, the, um, after that European Grand Prix, which Senna won, it was wet, of course, on the grid. It was raining and stuff. And, and there were lots of Senna, and lots of Sega girls with umbrellas and stuff on the grid, which Bernie hated because, again, it wasn't his sponsor. It was a team sponsor taking advantage of the world feed, which he didn't like at all, and, unless they paid for it. And this guy was down, it was at Cow's Week on the Isle of Wight, several weeks later in some relatively small hotel pub and the phone rings on a Sunday morning it's Bernie saying basically saying don't you ever bring those grid girls on again and don't you ever use those umbrellas again otherwise you're out click phone phone call ended traced him all the way to the cow's week on the Isle of Wight lots of Bernie stories lots far too many to tell right now not enough time in fact it's already nine o'clock and i promised the family i'll be finished by nine so i better stop mr bungle worst penalty in history of formula one how can they blame everything but the driver crashing on his own crazy yeah but uh, yeah a, a good point and i have made that point and but but equally if that is the penalty for what they think was brake testing and they were wrong to think that but if, if that is the brake testing penalty they need to revise it straight away because that's nothing like enough for something as savage as brake testing get my point um i just like as i said in the vid on sunday after the race i just like the way the penalty that Lance Stroll got for taking Fernando out on the straight in Austin and nearly taking Sebastian off on the straight in Brazil the same year it was nothing like enough that's why he did it to Sebastian in Brazil because it wasn't a bad, big enough penalty after Austin um, Robert Portelli hi Peter any predictions for Suzuka Red Bull again yeah I think I think it was a bit of a one-off with that Pirelli tyre thing and and also, no, partly the Pirelli tyre thing, that affected the result in terms of the Ferrari drivers, Carlos versus Charles, for the reasons that I've explained already. In terms of Red Bull versus Ferrari, I think the next two races will be more Red Bull heavy because although Ferrari have probably got the same sweet spot size now, if you can measure sweet spot, wouldn't that be a good thing for the graphics, at the F1 graphics to come up with sweet spot size? Um, but the sort of ability to manage the tyres and for the car to be drivable and chuckable and everybody to be confident. I think Ferrari and Red Bull are pretty much on a par now. But the one advantage Red Bull have still is top speed for the same downforce level that gives them that lovely sweet spot. So if you go to any circuit with a straight, Suzuka, Shanghai, you're going to have an advantage for Red Bull. But up the hill... For example, great section of road in, at Suzuka, the S's, through the top there, through Dunlop, down through the two Degners, right-hander, double apex right-hander, then through the hairpin, long to spoon, that long left-hander. I think the Ferraris will be really good there, really good. But then they'll get to the straight, and, for, and, and Red Bull will always have the slight edge on top speed. That's what I think. I may be wrong, but that's what I think. And so, therefore, you'll probably see both Ferrari drivers ahead of Perez, probably, but for Max for Max not to be super quick in Suzuka 
you'll have to have an issue. I think, and it's the same with China, I think. It's probably not that many drivers have driven around Shanghai. It's a great circuit, actually. I love Shanghai. Very long straight, though. Um, Stephen, I'm not quite sure what this is an answer to. That's McLaren Cartre, because Max is a short corner driver compared to Checo and has way better tyre wear. That's good to hear. You know, I agree with that. I'm not quite sure what you're replacing. Um, free speech. Peter, is Teddy Mayer still around? He was a regular at the Penske factory in Poole. Sadly, he's not. No, lovely guy. I used to really get on well with Teddy, which is why I get on well with Timothy, his um, son. Uh, he, and I asked him if he has any memories of Teddy in Formula One. He said, my only memory, this is Tim, who was a steward at the Australian Grand Prix. His only memory of his dad is Mexican Grand Prix 68 when... Um, Graham Hill won it but Denny Holm was in the running in the McLaren in that finale and he remembers the crowd afterwards invading the pit lane and the paddock and everything and he remembers his son his dad just swooping him up he's just a baby swooping him up in his arms and running towards the, the McLaren garage but no he's not um, he's sadly not with us Teddy I mean, Teddy was very he was very good he was very bright he's a lawyer obviously but I remember him once saying to me um and I never really thought this through, but you know, we're talking about, it was at time, there's a lot of talk about road safety and crashes and Ralph Nader and seat belts and all the rest of it. And I remember saying, oh, Peter, you know, you can, you can be killed in a car 25 miles an hour, no problem at all. And I thought about that for a long time and I finally realised he was absolutely correct. And then um, I was actually driving with him once on the M4 going into London and, and, and it was three lanes down to two. And he was, as we were doing that, he started explaining Bernoulli's principle, the vortex principle, which is basically the whole ground effect thing. And um, he's talking about it then. And it was, it's a perfect example of that, three lanes into two and how it, you know, causes the pressure zones. Yeah, he was a regular at the Penske factory at Poole. Fentry, Penske, factory, Penske factory at Poole. I'm trying to say that quickly 10 times. <laughs> Not exactly easy. Yeah, lovely times. I remember having a lovely um, dinner with Heinz Hoffer and Mark Donoghue in the pub near there and talking to Mark about the friction circle and, and I said um, I said so you, you discovered that on the skid pan he said skid pan what do you mean skid pan skin pad and I thought, oh, how did I say that wrongly? But of course, I didn't say it wrongly because I think the English do call it a skid pan and the Americans call it a skin pad after all that. So I wasn't that stupid. Anyway, I was in awe, as you can imagine. Sadly, we lost Heinz Hofer at that time, near that time. American, lovely guy. I know he was actually an Austrian ski instructor and then he became Roger's team manager. Really cool guy and uh, good looking guy. And he was, I think he lost his life due to some idiot or maybe up I don't know anyway I won't go into it but it was the bottom motorway uh, near Goodwood and he was going the wrong way he, he rejoined it and, uh, he, either he rejoined it or else somebody else is going the wrong way it was a head on it was terrible um, Macon says I'm concerned about Daniel Ricciardo's ability and resulting waning attitude. Do you believe that Daniel has a future or is it time to save some money and try out one of the many F2 grand grads? Thanks, sir. Yeah, I know what you're saying. There's Liam Lawson, unbelievable talent, standing there in the pit lane. Well, he's doing something, isn't he? But he's you know not doing Formula One, which he could quite easily do. And you wonder why he's not doing that. I mean, I suppose the only thought is... If they lose Honda, well, they're not with Honda anymore, and I presume that's going to affect Sonoda, who's doing a surprisingly good job. Not surprisingly, he is doing a great job. Don't no longer be surprised by Yuki. Um, and I, I guess maybe they thought, well, if we're going to lose Sonoda, we want this sort of experienced guy who'll stay in the team. We'll get Liam in alongside Daniel for 25. But now they may be thinking, maybe we'll keep Yuki as the, as the experienced guy and we'll get Liam in alongside him. Could be that. Yeah, I was, I think I said from day one, the minute Daniel decided that he was going to leave the best team in Formula One, i.e. Red Bull, because he didn't like the way it was going with Max winning races and he, Daniel, not winning as much as he thought he would or could if Max wasn't there. 
the minute he decided I'm better off not racing for Red Bull rather than just living with it and lo looking at what I do well and still winning some races, as Perez has done. He would have won more races than Perez if he'd stayed there, for sure, in my opinion. But the minute he made that decision, it was forget the money, forget Renault, forget McLaren, forget coming the year and not doing anything, forget where he is now. That eats away at the soul of what you are all about as a human being. Forget just in Formula One because you are, you're turning your back on something that you've actually strive to achieve all your life in other words a great racing car and he turned his back on that and that that has this this effect over a long period of time i think of taking away all the, the good things that you've got in your style in your motivation i'm sure in himself now daniel's feeling relaxed he's got his money in the bank we'll put that to one side so that's no longer an issue he's enjoying being a formula one driver again but I would suspect now race three, he's starting to think, I've got to start beating Sonoda. How am I going to do this? And let's see what happens. It's early days. He's only had three races. He might, it's hard to imagine that he's going to beat Sonoda around Suzuka, but he might beat him in Shanghai, for example. Um, and all he's got to do, let's face it, if he's beating Sonoda on a regular basis, he's, his stock is still quite high. It's just that he, if you're getting beaten by your teammate consistently, it's plunging and that's going the other way very quickly sort of double whammy so we'll see i was i did chat to daniel and he was yeah he's his normal self you can't tell anything or anything i've just said you don't get any evidence of that from the outside and you know his mum and dad are there and they're great guys and it's the whole daniel ricardo thing again which is we love it in formula one i do anyway i love seeing him around a great guy but the problem was leaving red bull and i'm not sure there's a solution for that and when you've got you know key red bull people when you're deciding to leave saying don't leave Daniel don't leave you're never going to win a race again or if you do it'll be one or two don't leave you can win a lot here if you stay with us and he still leaves difficult difficult to come back from that um, Liam Johnston after Carlos won in Melbourne there was a lack of chatter about Berman tough weekend for the young Ferrari driver yeah, you know, that's why I spent a bit of time down in the Prima garage just watching because I love all that ebb and flow of, you know, all this ridiculous hashtag fan adulation and then one minute and then they all disappear the next minute when everything changes. It just shows a complete lack of knowledge of motorsport, doesn't it? Uh, because there was it, the, probably the, the, it was over the top, it was over the top for Nick de Vries at Monza when he did jumped into two cars and equally it was a bit over the top with Oliver Berman in in Saudi Arabia. It's a, a pretty good car, the Ferrari. It's a great credit to Ferrari itself that, he, that a young guy, any young guy can jump in the car and go that well. A, B, he did a massive amount of work with, or has done with, with Jock Clear and his team in the academy. And to do what he did, it was great. But I don't think he's the only driver in the world that could have done that. And, uh, and it was put into perspective by suddenly from one great weekend, he's in Formula 2 seemingly going nowhere. That's why I spent, went down there because I knew there would be some issue. And of course, whilst most people were saying, oh, well, you know, one minute he's flying in Formula 1, then it's a big shock to get back to F2. Of course, he did a brilliant job with that engine problem and the piston and did as well to qualify where he did 16th, still a few cars behind. It was amazing, actually. Uh, just as amazing as Carlos Sainz's speed when he still had appendicitis before the operation on the Friday in Saudi Arabia. Just both of them, amazing performances, I thought. And Behrman was pretty good. He eventually got the penalty. But he's very good, Oliver Behrman, I think. Really good. I mean, read George Russell for Oliver Behrman. He's that good. And, uh, and it's interesting to see the two. You know, they sort of look at each other and didn't... I'm talking about Kimi Antonelli and... and this is one of the great pairings. You know, this is this is as good as it gets in terms of two ultra talented young drivers in a brilliant team. The the energy and the dynamic feel in that team is just amazing. I love it. Um, ben four eight one zero. You just knew Fred Vasseur would make a big difference at Ferrari when, within two weeks of him starting Ferrari party organizer in Gofa, Gino Rosati leaves the team. <laughs> well, you know more than I about that. Anyway. Farrow Gamma, yeah, he's talking about poor old Teddy, has passed away. He sold his share to Ron Dennis, that's right. Well, he had to sell his share to Ron Dennis. Uh, it was either lose the Marlborough sponsorship or sell your shares to Ron Dennis. 
Mm. Yeah, I want to take a bit of credit here because I was always saying that Haas, this is Mr. Bungle, the most encouraging Ferrari and Haas have been in the last 10 years. I was saying from day one, the minute they uh, appointed Ayo Komatsu as the new team principal at Haas, that would definitely be a turnaround for Haas. And sure enough, it's been proved. So that one I will like to take credit for. And I'm not surprised. And I think it'll continue as well. Two very good drivers. That's the key to it. But I don't think we were getting the best from the two or seeing the best from the two drivers in the way the team was being run. And I think we are starting to see that now. Still, still improvements to be made. But when the car is basically pretty good, which it always was going to be with Dallara and Ferrari and the Haas design team involved, great trio if you like triumph for it and two good drivers you get the best from those two drivers you're always going to have a pretty good team and i think that's what we got so good luck to them um right glenn this is going to be the last question i'm afraid because it is 9 30 and dexter i've got to take him for a walk that's very important, as I think you all know. Um, Peter, what do you think? This is from Glenn. Peter, what do you think that the Liberty or FIA can do to make sure that one car can follow closely and have good overtakes? <laughs> That's what this era is all about. What about making the car a bit lighter? GP2, GP3, love from Sri Lanka. Well, thanks for that question, because A, the regulations that we have now are entirely born of wanting to make the cars easier to overtake and having nothing like the same amount of turbulence coming in the back of the car and therefore it's easier to follow and easier to do the overtake. That kind of went sideways with all the changes that have been made to the regulations to stop the bouncing of the cars and there's more grit, more, more downforce now, there's more turbulence out the back and so that's one thing. But beyond that, I was talking to uh, actually, I talked to Steve Nielsen, who's, as you know, left the FIA and he's now consulting F1 again. He was full time with FIA and he's now consulting F1. Just shows the state of the, you know, Liberty F FIA thing. Now. He left the FIA um, after a relatively short period of time. He's a really good guy, Steve Nielsen, and now he's back with F1. And I said, you know, where are we at for 26 in terms of we know we're going to the new power units with the 50% electrification, but where are we at in terms of lighter, more nimble? smaller cars which i understand is the sort of working idea for 2028 and he said oh no no, we're now bringing that forward we're trying to make the cars for 26 lighter and more nimble and smaller and i said as you would well good luck with that um to which he laughed but that's good news to me which also means of course they haven't in any way defined the regulations yet for 26 the car regulations so there's a certain point at which they will be defined and then the teams will start designing and building their cars i think it's the beginning of sometime next year anyway obviously the beginning of next year i think around february maybe I'm not sure of that exact date but anyway getting back to it i said well presumably that's going to be the smaller you can make the batteries and the lighter you can make the batteries the more chance of that happening and, and and then I spoke to another few other engineers, technical directors up and down the pit lane about the question of is Formula One going to be able to do more faster in terms of battery development, size and weight than any other part of the battery industry globally, given the way Formula One is and how good the people are and how much money and how much uh, technical uh, base there is to engineering in Formula One, are we going to see big breakthroughs in the size and weight of, and, and obviously durability of batteries? And generally speaking, the answer was yes. So I'm quite excited about that. I'm not, a, I'm not brilliantly, I'm not brilliantly knowledgeable about electric cars. And I suppose they still leave me cold in a sort of Nigel Roebuck-esque Ferrari V12 sort of way. But I do like the idea of Formula One coming up with batteries that are lighter and smaller and more efficient than anything we've seen in the history of batteries. It may not happen, of course, and there's a lot of things that need to fall into place for that to happen. But I don't see any way other than batteries. I don't see any other way the cars will be lighter and smaller and more nimble than these cars from 26 onwards, unless it is around the batteries, because the batteries are going to be such a major part of the car, are they not, in terms of mass? That's interesting. And then maybe some other areas as well, materials um, and aero regulations too. Interesting. More on that, I think, as time 
unfolds towards 2026. So there we are. That's that live stream, two and a half hours. I hope you don't mind if I, I'm still pretty jet lagged actually. It's kind of, um, I'm trying to work out why I'm quite jet lagged. So I was asking Mark Webber um, how he gets through, how he got through jet lag. And he said, oh mate, you always got to make sure that you arrive in the mornings and get straight out in the sunlight and get your body used to the, the new day, which I've been doing. I've been doing this all my life. And I generally, I, I find that if I work out when I normally work out, my body clock just gets back into it. But on this occasion, for some reason, it hasn't. I don't know why. Maybe because I was keeping quite odd hours in Australia as well. That's probably it. Anyway, bottom line is two and a half hours. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching, being a part of it. Thank you to Pitbox and Jet, Jetcraft, two of my, well, my two great companies, um, which you can read about in the description, without which we wouldn't have this channel the way it is. So thank you very much to them. But thank you to you too roll on the Japanese Grand Prix at Suzuka. Can't wait for that. Love that circuit. Great to be going back there so relatively soon and good to be going back to Shanghai two weeks after that as well. Uh, this Asian leg of the Formula One World Championship. So um, maybe next week another live stream. We'll see. Fairly busy at the moment. We'll see how we get on. If not, definitely be doing the normal three videos from Suzuka. So thanks for watching and uh, let me just get ready to do my normal ending here, which means I have to go to a different page. Uh, it's a completely different page. That's the wrong page we're on now. Where are we? Uh, here we are over here. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for watching, um, bearing with me, obviously, and uh, see you very soon. Take care. Mm -hmm.